Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the 303rd edition of the Boxing Asylum Nutters podcast. I'm your host, Steve Wellings, and joining me on the call this evening, we have Adam Smith, Ozzy Smith, and Andy Patterson as well. We were just talking off air there, a bit of rocky fielding against Canelo coming up next week. That's the big one, I suppose. Well, I mean, you've got Warrington Frampton, haven't you, on the 22nd? You've got White Chisora too as well, so there's plenty of action to take us out. Charlo as well. Yeah, there's a, there's a few fights close to Christmas, which isn't usually the norm in my experience, but there you go anyway. Uh, Rocky versus Canelo, they're pitching it as on the zone. So they're not mentioning the surname, it's just Rocky against Canelo, so a little bit of sly marketing there. Anyway, I digress, everybody. Let's get on with the action from this weekend. We'll be taking a look at Kel Brook very shortly against Michael Zarafa. The, uh, the male stripper, I'd rather watch an hour's application of paint stripper, to be honest with you, than that shite ever again. We'll be discussing some Woo! dodgy titles as well <laughs> over in France, Andy. We'll be going to South Africa as well very briefly, just touching upon things. Lots of talk uh, on the questions. Value of the week, so I've got about 50-odd as usual. And uh, Tyson Fury, a lot of Tyson Fury, chat a few Tyson Fury questions coming in as well. So we'll be dealing with that. No doubt people will be dropping on and off as the evening progresses. Let's start off, though, shall we, over in... New York, Madison Square Garden Theatre, Vasil Lomachenko, 12-round points decision over Ho Jose Pedraza, Andy. It felt like champion against challenger for me beforehand. I didn't really give Pedraza any type of chance. Didn't really give him his respect for being the WBO king. Lomachenko obviously holds the WBA, one of their trinkets anyway. So it was a unification. And Pedraza, fair play to him. He really came and he had a go against Lomachenko. Lomachenko stood in the pocket a lot more than he usually does and he let the shots go and he wanted to to get hit by Pedraza. And I tell you what, he certainly did get hit because this guy laid a few hands on him at times, whether it was down to Lomachenko or not. But I, I want to start off by giving Pedraza credit because from a personal point of view, I didn't give him any props at all last week. I thought this was going to be a massacre. It was going to be like the Jason Souza fight, possibly like the Walters fight. But it wasn't. He did come and have a go. He did. Um, I did say last week that, you know, it was skyscraper levels here with regards to Lomachenko and Pedraza. But in the end, you can see, I thought Pedraza did really well considering, you know, he's up against a guy who is obviously levels, in my opinion, above him. A lot of fainting in that, obviously, early doors. Lomachenko obviously does what he usually does, has, has a look to see where the, the openings are and the gaps and stuff and tries tries and registers these things so he can start kind of thinking three moves ahead and stuff. But uh, Pedraza, kind of, I thought he, he really thought himself away through, through that fight. Try to let his hands go, try to kind of catch Loma as he kind of, you know, Loma does that kind of tip to the right and tries to then come back underneath and stuff like that. So he was trying to kind of catch him with the right hand. Um, he, he did pretty well as well with some straight shots. He did try to work the body as well for, for time to time. Um, and just kind of really, you know, I, I thought he kind of tried his, you know, his absolute best, you know. Um, but I did think as the fight kind of wore on, Lomachenko is just his, his stamina probably kind of probably told better, um, you know. Some of those rounds may have been close, but I just think if you look at it, you know, especially with the left hand by Lomachenko, that he was, he was, you know, when they landed it, it was, it was very telling. It was kind of flashy and stuff, and he was kind of catch them obviously kind of late, late on as, as the fight went on. Uh, Loving round was, you know, he was obviously kind of trying to push for it. Um, I, I, I don't know how. I'd meant to check actually how bad the, the operation was for the uh, for the shoulder, but if it's reconstructive or not, I can understand why he's not been showing as many hooks and uppercuts and stuff. For, for the, the right hand and stuff, if he's if he's just really kind of want to test it. I mean, to be honest, how many fighters would come back for surgery and actually go in a unification fight in his next fight? Um, regardless of what kind of level Pedraza is at. I know some people will look at Pedraza and be saying as he got knocked out by Giovanni Davis, but that was weight below. Um, he, he maintains it was probably kind of you know, weight drained at that, whatever. But uh, I can see some people kind of being kind of down on Lomachenko and that. But I think it's, um, it's quite telling when people... We'd probably kind of look at the performance here last night and say, you know, it was the loma of what we expect. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of kind of, you know, what's went before him. You know, been a lot of praise, a lot of kind of plaudits, and a lot of kind of loftiness kind of sent Lomachenko's way. So we're expecting, you know, fantastic things from him each time we see him fight. And just last night he was uh, just kind of like, you know, get the rounds in and he uh, takes it on for there. But um, he's obviously, again, he's talking unification fights in his next fight or if possible late next year, Garcia. So, um, as for Pedraza, um, I don't think he was, he was, you know, anyway sort of fact, uh, shamed in that uh, that performance here last night. Um, he can certainly kind of come again. Um, and I thought he did put in the best performance possible. Uh, just, just, uh, just as the fact is, this Lomachenko was levels above him. 
Yeah, I think sometimes it actually doesn't matter if you win or lose. That might sound like a strange thing to say, but the likes of Pedraza last night, what did he, you know, he went in and he had a real good go at Lomachenko and he will come out with more credit, I think, from that fight. And people will want to see him again. It doesn't matter that he's lost, but he's put his belt up there, Smido, against Lomachenko and he's tried to win the fight. A little bit of kryptonite for Loma. We know that he moves a lot to the right-hand side. They picked up that on the ESPN broadcast. Also, the right hand. Lenares had success with the right hand, obviously, and dropped him. Um, uh, Lomachenko himself has said that he got dropped in the amateurs by the right hand. Pedraza obviously was having a go before, when he wasn't turning southpaw, and he was throwing the right hand. Any word on Lomachenko's possible flaws, Smido? Was it a case of Loma just standing in the pocket more and just wanting to fight with Pedraza rather than him suddenly being easier to hit? Uh, that was apparent to me. I think his biggest and most obvious flaw is just going to be size, sheer size. Not, I'm not saying Pedraza's a, a giant by any stretch, but I mean, just going forward, um, I mean, we've got to remember that three fights ago, Pedraza was fighting in the in the weight category below. Um, so, And I think we said this after uh, Loma against Lenares that, um, you know, with his ambitions to, to, be, to unify and move up divisions, that's when he's going to start coming unstuck. I mean, I personally, I'm not saying he can't win at the at the, at the next division up the ten stone division, but it, um, every time he steps up, he's more he's more likely to lose because just of the of the sheer size disadvantage he's going to have. Lenores was bigger than him. Pedraza was bigger than him last night, even though he Pedraza won't go down as the biggest lightweight of all time. Um, I just thought that um, the credit must go to Pedraza for last night because um, he stuck to his game plan um, v- very well. Um, I know that, that that sounds an obvious one, but it's diffi- um, I'm guessing it's pretty difficult to do that against Lomachenko because there's not many Lomachenkos on the planet. You know, you come up against him, he's creating the angles, he's stepping to the side, he's fo- he disguises his power punches and his tippy tappy punches very well. That's well, that's what I would call him anyway. Um, he's just something that you, you don't you, you don't come across very often in your in your boxing career, and to and to stick to your game plan under those circumstances is. Um, is is something to to get credit for. I thought Lenares did that very well, but also in the last fight, um, I thought that um, I thought, like we say, it's 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 interesting with with Loma because not only is he be, is he coming off his, uh, his surgery as Andy alluded to, and as you alluded to last week, Steve, um, Loma's um, so called keep busy fights or non, uh, you know, non headline fights, if you like, are unifications. Um, and, and genuine unifications at that. So, you know, the, we've got to um, we've, we sometimes have to sit back and, you know, just because he's not knocked him out this time, we have to sit back and realise what we're actually taking in it. Yeah. So he's coming off the in, in, injury and, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's mocked up another title. Um, the one thing that I watched the Rocky Martinez fight in the week as well, Steve, and the one thing that I find very, very impressive, obviously impresses in a lot of different departments, um, Lomachenko, is that I think last night it was around the... Ran and um, when he just before he knocked him down, was that in the eleventh? Was the knockdown in the eleventh or the tenth? Yeah, he nearly um, battered him in the eleventh, didn't oh, he? <laughs> I mean, he must have he must have had thir- at least thirty unanswered punches there. Landed um, forty three power punches, I believe. Wow, and and so, well, you've got to give credit to Pedraza there for surviving that. But the one thing that gets me, Steve, is that um, and he definitely the, the knockout to Rocky Martinez was uh, was was part of this as well. That he um when he. he Lomachenko can see a, um, an opening on the move um, when he's on the move or when the opponent's on the move or sp- probably both sometimes. So I think last night it started with an uppercut and he didn't throw all that many of them last night. But he, he just sees the slightest bit, uh, slightest opening and it's almost when the opponent... And last night I think Pedraza thought he was almost out of range. Next thing you know is it with an uppercut and he's... That was hurt. in the ninth. He was on the exit strategy, wasn't he, Pedraza? And all of a sudden the uppercut come in, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, and that's it. And it was, you know, it was almost a, a little bit similar to Martinez as well. He thought he was out there. Next thing you know, he's eating. I think it was a, 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 a pretty much a right hook, and, and he's down. Um, and that's what I find most impressive. Obviously, that if you let, if you're a um, Nicholas Walters and you just let Lom- you stand in front of him and let Lomachenko do what he wants, obviously he's going to box rings around you, literally box rings around you. But like, like the, it's the unplanned, it's the unplanned stuff like that opening for the uppercut last night. Um, that that really impressed me. You just you just clearly ca- cannot switch off. Um, and yeah, I'm just I'm just happy to see Lomachenko active. Um, you know, looking for unifications, other challenges, or other weights. Um, but that's what will get him beat eventually. Um, because he, he, because the size will just be will just be too much for him. But it will make him into entertaining fights. Um, obviously, the right hand was shown as a a weakness. Um, 
in the Lenores fight, um, and that will probably be be similar going forward. But I just love watching him. I think he's absolutely fantastic. He is, Smido. Just another final stylistic one. I was having a think last night when I saw in the early rounds Pedraza standing. Obviously, Lomachenko was standing in range, so Pedraza was there popping the, the left hand, the jab, double, tripling the jab, and bringing the right hand behind it. It was quite basic but effective, and I was thinking to myself, Mikey Garcia does those type of things on a much higher level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, two, the two of them would, be, would just be sensational to watch, but um, Garcia might have already took his one step too far. Um, in 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 his next fight against Spence, and I think you know it's 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 not going to be long until until Lomachenko goes one step too far as well, unfortunately. But he took that loss early in his career. Um, he's clearly um he's clearly not shirking the challenge. I mean, he could he could stay around super featherweight for for the rest of his career and absolutely dominate. But he's looking for he's looking for new challenges. So with with this top rank, Steve, um, is that it? Uh, so um, it's not top rank. So um. HBO is it HBO that's going in the bin? Well, we be- we believe so. Yeah, that that's the end of them with Breakers and Clarissa Shields last night. We think they're done. Yeah, right. So yeah, be- but but Lomachenko's on ESPN, is it? Lomachenko's on ESPN. So is Terence Crawford. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's yeah, like I said, pl- plenty of options. He's not scared of a challenge, and he's pretty de- pretty active, which we which we all like. Yeah, we like a bit of activity, Rob. A bit of activity from you will go down just lo- nicely now. Uh, Lomachenko, is in- he's insanely talented, isn't he? I think Smido's right there, Rob. Whenever he, he he's taking that second loss, that third loss, it's going to be weight, size. That's going to beat him, I think. He's going to be moving up, taking on challenges against guys who are just too big. Talking about challenges, I was thinking to myself, last night, whenever Pedraza was having pockets of success throughout the fight, which he did, Rob, which we've spoken about, could you imagine Javonta Davis with that hand speed? You could imagine him tagging, laying hands on Loma at times, couldn't you? You know, judging the way he was standing in distance last night. Davis is, is fast and he punches oh, hard. Sorry, I'm just going out of range of Wi-Fi into, into 4G territory there. So let me know if my sound is holding up okay. Am I all right? Yeah, go ahead, sir. Yeah, no, I think I think Tank is easy work for Lomachenko, dude. I, I can definitely understand the appeal of that fight more after Lomachenko's performance last night. And I don't even want to criticise his performance too much because he's fighting a two-weight world champion who's got physical advantage. Yeah, Rob. So you on the way out there, Rob. Yeah. Yeah. You've been KO'd, Rob. I think. Do you want to have fight. another go? Hold on one sec. How are we sounding now? Yeah, go yeah. on. Yeah, I think um, I don't. I don't want to dog his performance too much because he he dominated the fight. Like I mean, he won the fight clearly. Um, all right, maybe he wasn't as dynamic as he's been uh, earlier, but coming off surgery, facing the two weight world champion who's got the physical attributes over him. Changed his style a little bit, thought he planted his feet a little bit more, dug in a little bit. But, I mean, some one thing to watch for Lomachenko, I don't know if this will be covered already, like, because I just have to jump it on, so sometimes I end up doubling up on what Andy's after saying. But um, I think that, like, you know, 452 amateur fights is going to take its toll on him too, and he's 30 now. So we probably missed the prime of him turning pro, maybe with a second Olympic campaign. He, and I know he wants to go down as one of the greatest fighters ever, but he is going to slow down a little bit, and maybe... Over the last two fights, we've seen a little bit, little small signs of that. But I mean, a completely dominant performance. All right, Pedroza made it a competitive fight. There's a difference between a close fight and a competitive fight. Pedro- Pedroza was competitive in the rounds, but he was still losing them. Like, and he wasn't really causing Lomachenko any great problems. I didn't think that he couldn't solve. And it's the accuracy of him. Like in the eleventh, Jesus, like <laughs> he hit Pedroza with five uppercuts from three different angles in the space of about 10 seconds. Like, if you can't marvel at Lomachenko, even on a, on a so-called off night, I don't know what sports you, you, you're better off watching, but we know with the casuals, a lot of them don't even know how to score around. Like, But, you know, just some of the things he's doing in the ring are superb. I hope he sticks around for a long time. The Mikey Garcia one, I think you're onto something with that. That's that's what I thought after the Linares fight. I thought he beat, he beat the best lightweight in the world that wasn't uh, Mikey Garcia that night. And Mikey is... Bigger than him as well, surgical with the right hand, probably a, a tough for opponent than than Lanares. And I think he's probably the only one out there that could I could see beating him currently in and around his weight division, uh, or giving him a very close fight would be Mikey Garcia. But then again, you wonder if he's fighting Mikey Garcia, is he going to up at a level again, and was he just taking Pedraza, Pedraza lightly last night? Um, because again, the accuracy. Of and his get out of jail card like if he is having a bit of a struggle moment he's able to hit the precise part 
on the body that drops you. His solar plexus shots and his, his kidney shots and everything, they're so accurate. Like, he dug two into the body last night against Pedraza and he just, he was lucky to make it through the round and he comes out of the fight with a lot of credit as well for his performance, for, for hanging in there and going and having a real go. But I thought Lamachenko was streets ahead last night. I don't really know what people are saying on, on Twitter today. Like, he slipped. I thought he was streets ahead of a very good fighter. Like, But I understand that the, the, the Tank Davis, because of the comparisons, Tank knocked him out. And Tank, I'd say, would take encouragement from that performance and he might be able to find Loma. But I think that fight's easy work for Lomachenko. Like, I think he boxes the ears off Tank Davis. Can you imagine if Lomachenko came back there and fought like a, a bum there last night instead of likes to coming back and fighting like in a unification fight? What happens if he'd come back, maybe, say, uh, defended against, who knows, say, like, say, the, um, the Italian Marcelli or something like that, or someone like Jose uh, Zapata or Devin Haney? Mm. He's slaughtered. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, he would have schooled that guy. See, so you see, he went at twelve rounds the last night with the people like that. You know, he'd have been fucking lambasted last night like, against a fellow titleist. Yeah, you see, you're you judging know, him against saying, himself. You've got to be, yeah, but because he's, he's set the standards so high, mate. That's the problem. Yeah, if the standards so high for him. He's got to be producing the goods every time. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think because we got a fight of the year in the previous fight with Linares, that when you see a guy like Pedraza, maybe. Taking him a little bit longer to figure him out, and t- I like it. T- I think he changed his style last night. I think he, he purposely dug in there to try yeah, some new I, I stuff. Think like so. he- yeah, I think so too. Yeah, so but yeah, Loma's still the king, like for sure. Yeah, I was going to say the same as Rob. There, I completely agree. I don't think he slipped to such. I think he was standing in the pocket a lot more, and, and he didn't want to get hit, Andy. But I think he was definitely planting his feet more, trying new things. I'm, I, no detriment to. I tell you what, as well, Andy. By the way, before I forget it, Pedraza, I thought in the eleventh round showed the classic example of how you try and survive an absolute mm-hmm. onslaught because he tried to throw at the right times. He tried to hold. He tried to shell up at the right times. He was always moving, wasn't he? He was. He was staving off the referee, I thought, by trying to move his head. He was getting bopped around the ring, but he didn't give the referee an excuse to jump in. I thought that was really good from Pedraza. He stopped himself from getting stopped. Yeah, he, he, he really did dig in. Uh, both parties did that, actually. I mean, you could even see, I, well, I can't even speak Ukrainian, but I think the, the way his dad was kind of be animated in the corner, was, I don't know if he was trying to get him to, help him to push it or whatever. whatever. But uh, no, Pedraza, you know, doing the right time, probably. He was covering up, he was trying to bob and weave under the shots. As Rob says, he was taking a hell of a lot of punches for numerous different angles. Um, the, the other thing as well is, well, I, I don't know if it's maybe something to do with the size. I mean, you obviously can see the, the different size with Pedraza, you know, his length. His height. I did think that Lomachenko was. I, I think he was he's slightly more bulk than he was for the Linares fight. Maybe it's just you know I need to go back and kind of compare it. But um, you, you see the way we kind of like Lomachenko fainting and the way he try kind of tries to draw it and stuff like. That. He's clearly kind of he's not diminished, but he's, he's he tries to make up for the fact that he's not got his long arms. So he's got to try and kind of get himself into distance and stuff. So he's got to faint. He's got to kind of jab, move, and kind of like move his ankles. So that's how he can. That's how he can get his his, his big power punches off. Um, as I say, I, I I get what people are saying, but at the same time, I thought he was still, and knowing that any problems, he didn't seem to be flustered there. Maybe the tenth, you know, uh, Pedraza really put it on him on the on the tenth. But other than that, I I just thought he was he was just Lomachenko. You know, it was like you know how he was at the start of his career, and that's you know, I remember fighting the um, the Thai fella Macau. You know, just basically dominated the guy just without getting into kind of, out of third gear, moved along. And they really kind of like, but then if you look at it as well, as he really tried to kind of push for the knockout, and he, he gave me he gave me his due, he gave me respect, and even kind of said that his, his jab was was absolutely fantastic the last night by by Pedraza, gave him a lot of problems. He was marked up under the left eye, I think it was the left eye anyway. So and plus obviously as well, he was getting caught with the right hand for time to time. But uh, no, it was just um, you know Pedraza, as I say, is definitely no, no disgrace, and he did come and have a go. Good stuff, Ozzy. Let's bring you in then for your point of view. Uh, we're looking... I, I don't know what you think about pound for pound, Ozzy. Obviously, these questions always raise their head, don't they, after a pound for pound claimant has performed. I'd probably say Lomachenko is my number one. I thought it really matters what people think, you know, about my opinion on pound for pound and stuff. But Terence Crawford, I do I do struggle with some of the names on his record, you know, the big standout names. Uh, but we're not getting bogged down in that, I suppose. So just tell me what you thought about Lomachenko's performance. And more, more to the point, Ozzy, about the style. Do you think it was a case of he decided, he opted to stand and trade a little bit more than usual? He was probably shaking off the rust after the operation, shaking off the rust in a unification. It's just a measure of him, isn't it? I think one people uh, one thing people forget is we've probably got a featherweight, a natural featherweight, boxing up at lightweight. So he's always going to be boxing bigger guys. 
And these bigger guys against fights with skill sets such as Linares, Pedraza, they are going to take it out of him of sorts. He's not had luck this short career like, like Rob mentioned. He's had, was it 300-plus amateur fights? He's not had any gimmies when he's turned over as pro. And like I said, he's, he's gone, what's he, a three-weight world champion now already? And he's had, what, 13 fights? So naturally, it's going to get to a stage from where, you know, these bigger guys may take its toll on him. And he's, and he's not going to completely, you know, like dominate from the off. I thought Pedraza put in a career best performance last night and he still lost. So I think that shows the, the quality and the skills of Lomachenko. Uh, coming off an injury uh, in an excellent fight against Jorge Linares. And I think the sport of boxing, I think what people love to do is criticise and rather than praise. And like Andy mentioned, if that was a British fighter, he would have come off and he would have been back in against a, so if it was a heavyweight, you know, like a Travis Kaufman or something like that, who we saw last week. Vasil Lomachenko's come off an injury there, and he's gone straight in with a uh, with a unification bout, and he won convincingly. So, in my opinion, he for me, he's, he's definitely the pound for number one. He may not have been a, a sublime best last night, but I don't think he was ever really troubled. And I mean, moving on now, it's it's going to be interesting to see where he goes. R really interesting. I, I think there's a stage now where size will definitely start to take its toll. I'd love to see the Garcia fight. I, I, what I couldn't think of anything better to do than rip up the Errol Spence Mikey Garcia fight and put Garcia in with Lomachenko. I think that's the fight that everybody would rather see. It's a lot more competitive. And I think it would really produce the best out of both fighters. Because in terms of size comparison, etc., things like that, skill set, I just don't think you can pick a better fight at the moment that you could put these two in uh, with each other at all. Well said, Ozzy. Uh, let's move on to the undercard, Andy. Isaac Dogbo. Now, this was a bit of a, an upset, wasn't it? I was thinking to myself, well... You know, I suppose he lost to Navarrete. He has a bit of previous form. And I was getting him mixed up with the Navarrete. I thought Diego Higa. This is not him. This is Emmanuel Navarrete. A lot of punchy, a lot of uh, knockout wins. But he's been fighting on the Mexican scene. So he's the sort of best on that circuit. But he stepped up to world level. And he did to Dogbo. I suppose what Dogbo did to Jesse Magdalena. I wasn't expecting this one, Andy, to be honest with you. I thought Dogbo's reign was going to be uh, plentiful for the next few years. or Well, the next few months, I suppose. Maybe not years. But you, you know what I mean? I was surprised at the size, actually. I mean, in all honesty, um, for what I saw, I thought Navarrete definitely won the fight. Uh, I know I'm on the dog bow hype train. I'm not going to get off it just now. I'm still going to be on it. Um, but I had, I thought he had major problems, especially with the with, with the height and reach. Um, you could tell as well some of those shots that he was landing Navarrete was actually kind of causing dog a fair bit of problems. He, he felt them. Um, I, I believe Navarrete even maybe even broke his right hand during the fight as well. So that was probably what kind of you know brought him. More back in the fight, Dogbo. Um, you know, but it had, I thought it was, it was at the tenth. I thought he did really hurt Dogbo in that one. Um, so I've no complaints whatsoever. Actually, both both guys put it on the line. Um, so Dogbo again. I, I wouldn't go right for a rematch. In all honesty, actually, maybe try and go another route at the minute. But uh, I thought Navarrete was just you know just again the height and reach, punching down and stuff like. He was causing major problems for for the kind of smaller Dogbo. So I've no complaints whatsoever. Good stuff, Andy. Thank you for that analysis. As always, delighted to have on the call our first guest of the evening, friend of the pod, Carl Greaves. How are you, Carl? Hi, you mate. You okay? Not too bad. Thanks for joining us. We'll get stuck yeah, straight no in. We'll get stuck straight in there, Carl. Um, just before we get on to the the main the main you know the main course, I suppose. Tell me about Kel Brook. We haven't discussed him yet against Michael Zarafa, but what did you think of his performance, Carl? You know what, mate? He went out there the first round and uh, he looked a million dollars. I thought, this isn't going to go three rounds, you know what I mean? But as the fight went on, he just sort of like really ran out of ideas, to be honest. And the kid proved a lot tougher than everybody expected. And, and he really dug deep and he had a big heart, that as a, the ref, as a ref. So um, it was um, it turned out an interesting fight. I mean, Carl won, but he never had it all his own way. Took far too many shots, but... Listen, it was it was it is what it is, isn't it? I mean, K 
is Cal going to get better than that? I hope he does when he comes up, back up to uh, world level. So we'll just see. Well, I mean, obviously they're dangling the Amir Khan carrot, but Khan seems to have him on strings at the moment from what I can see. Is, is that fight ever going to happen, do you think? You know what? I don't, I don't think it is. I just don't think it's going to happen. Um, me and Khan might have watched that last night and thought, you know what, I'll take this fight because um, it might be an easy, a lot easier night's work than, than first fought. But I don't know. I mean, it should have happened a while ago and it's just dragging on there and it's just getting hard work for people and people's losing interest. I mean, it's a shame, I mean, because it's a great fight, but they're both past the best, I think. Um, so we'll, we'll just see if it does happen. On the undercard last night, obviously, Josh Kelly was supposed to fight David Avanesi and the fight didn't happen. We've heard the official line about Kelly withdrawing through illness. From In your point of view, Carl, what's what's the lowdown? What's the story? It's all a little bit strange, really, um, because obviously he did he did the public. We got down there Wednesday. I mean, I've been down in Sheffield since Wednesday with David, and I've only just got back this afternoon. So it's been a long four days, to be honest. And um, I'm, I'm a bit drained with it all. I'm a bit I'm a bit cheesed off. But I mean, it's it's all a bit strange. Like I say, I mean, he, Josh Kelly did the public workout Wednesday. After me and David, as we was leaving, me and David, we didn't hang about. We did our, we did our, we did our bit, and then went straight back up to the hotel room. And obviously, we saw Josh Kelly in the lobby. He was about to do his, or was getting ready to do his. Um, seen a little bit of footage of him doing it. He looked perfectly fine. Everything looked good. Um, at the press conference, he was saying all the right things. He's saying he felt a million dollars, the best he's ever felt, and he's looking forward to the fight. And and. Um, so we just thought, yeah, it's going to be great. I mean, David's been in fantastic condition. Uh, I've had four weeks with him. I mean, he was in great condition before he come over. He's, he's a fitness fanatic. He trains hard in Russia. Um, and then when we got the call, it was over with, over within two days. I picked him up from Heathrow, went straight into camp on the Sunday. And um, that was it. So we, we was all set for it. I was expecting... A great performance from David. I was expecting to upset Josh Kelly. Um, Josh is a great fighter, great amateur, looking looking great as a pro, but hasn't really been in with anybody of David's calibre. And I thought, when the fight was made, I thought, God, we'll set this all day long. It's a great, great fight for David, I think. I mean, I think it was too early for Josh, personally, but time would have told. And obviously, unfortunately, we haven't got to see it yet. But... Um, yeah, so obviously we did. He did the uh, public work. I did the press conference. Um, was hearing rumours around that he was struggling with weight. Um, when it come to the weight, he didn't look great in my eyes. His eyes looked a bit dark. Um, he didn't look. He didn't look great. The head to head, he was. He looked confident. Was putting his head in David's head, and the both was up for it. Um, then we got the news that they wanted to change the fight from, from 12 rounds, which we was contracted to do. Obviously, David's manager, Neil Marsh, was contracted. He had a contract for 12 rounds. Eddie said that he wanted 12 rounds. Um, originally, we thought we were made £150, but we, he got changed to 147 which suited us a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then obviously, they wanted to do it for, for a title, WBA International, over 12 rounds. So we thought, great, yeah, we'll have that. The longer the fight goes, the more it suited David. And our game plan was to finally get to Josh. I mean, we knew the first few rounds would have been hard. But anyway, so that was that. Um, we disputed it. We didn't want to. Uh, we didn't want ten rounds. We finally uh, decided to go with ten rounds on the condition that the match room gave David uh, an eight-round fight if he lost, um, a comeback fight if he lost, or a big a big fight if he won. So we accepted the the offer, um, and then we finally yeah. So we said we'd do we'd do the ten rounds. We did the rules meeting at twelve o'clock on the day. Um, Adam, we've come to the rules meeting. There was me and Neil Marsh in there. We did, we did the rules meeting. We checked the gloves, listened to the WBA to all the all the rules and regulations. Um, off he went. Um, I went to lay on the bed upstairs. Um, Neil Marsh ran me and said, Carl, come down to reception, I need to see you. I got down and he said, Kelly's pulled out, he's ill. No explanation. Apparently, they just, they just left left the hotel, Josh and Adam. Um, and that was it. So, 
no fight, basically. But what I can't understand is why did Adam Booth come to the rules meeting at 12 o'clock when he knew that Josh wasn't well or apparently wasn't well to pull him out an hour and a half later? It's just a disgrace. I mean, it's absolute disgrace. Yeah, it's, it's a, it is a very strange situation. I must admit, whenever I saw the, the fight down, you know, David against Josh, a lot of people are talking about Josh, you know, all this ability. And I thought, oh, here we are. We're going to see him tested now because David's obviously someone who's gone the distance with Lamont Peterson. He's obviously beaten, you know, Sugar Shane Mosley and all this type of stuff. So I thought, here, we're going to see it now. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you don't want to put words in your mouth or anything. You can only take it at face value, can't you? But you think there's maybe more to it than meets the eye? Yeah, I, just, I don't know. I mean, I just I knew that David was confident. I mean, I've never... We, I mean, like I said, we only had four weeks. I mean, we've done a lot of training. I mean, I've had David for, for three and a half years now, starting off with the um, with the uh, Charlie Navarro WB Interim fight in uh, Monte Carlo. Then we got the Mosley fight in Arizona. Um, and then we lost to Peterson in Cincinnati. We've had some... Listen, I've had the time of my life with David. I've done things with with David and, and that, that I'll probably never do before or if I ever do I'll be really appreciated if I could but we've done fantastic things together and obviously as a team with Neil Marks the manager I'm the trainer and, and we've done some fantastic things and seen, being in the same places would never have done but probably never will do but um, regarding that I mean I'm just I was I was really confident. David had a great camp and, and the sparring was fantastic. He was looking great. He times he was beating all his records and it was it was he was looking good and really, really confident. David knew that he had to win this fight. I mean obviously since he lost to Kavalowskis um, last time, who is a is an awesome puncher, a great fighter, he knew that he needed to win this and and, and he was really determined he was a different seemed a different character and different person to what to what seen for a while, you know what I mean? Mm. Um it was confident around the hotel and, and everything was going really well and I'm just it's just disgraceful really. I'm I'm really, really upset and disappointed. I mean I've spent I'm glad it was only four weeks to be honest, because I mean if it had been an eight, ten week camp, yeah. then it'd have been even worse. I mean there's been we've been compensated with our expenses, we've been given a minor <laughs> A minor bit of money um, out of his purse. We've not been paid nowhere near the money that we should have done. But I mean, obviously, Dave is really, really upset. I mean, he, he lives in Russia. He ain't got a lot of money. I mean, he's earned some good money, but I mean, he, 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 that's what he does for a job boxing. He ain't got any other thing. So um, we're all upset. We're all disappointed. Um, we've been told the fight might go on again in February, but. We'll have to see. We'll have to see what David wants to do now. I mean, he might he might end up going to America um, to train now. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But we're we're all disappointed. Do you feel, Carl, that you maybe should have been paid half the purse, or maybe you know slightly more monetary compensation? Yeah, I mean, I don't really. I didn't really want to get into all that to be honest. But I mean, obviously, when you're talking away, things come out. But um, it. it <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, oh, we should have been paid it a lot more, I think, than what we did, but we've settled on that. Um, and obviously, the fight's been rearranged for February, and, and whether it'll happen or not now, I don't know. I mean, Dave is absolutely distraught. He just seems really down, and would he want to go through all that again? Um, all the time and effort. I mean, you've got to realise with David as well. I mean, I'm his trainer, but he's he's in my he's in a little town in my town in Newark mm. on his own. He don't know nobody. I'm not just his trainer. I have to I have to do everything mm. for him. I have yeah. to pick, I have to I have to pick him up to go training. We go training. Um, obviously, I'm waiting around. We do the session. It's like three hour. It's like a three hour session. You know what I mean? The time I've picked him up, done his warm up, done his hands, done the done the training. Wait for him. Waited for him to have his shower. Taking him back home. It, it's a long day, and it's been a lot of hard work these last four weeks. And and I'm a busy guy. You know what I mean? I'm not just a trainer, a manager, and promoter. And it's been really, really hard and draining. I mean. We've travelled miles and miles to Spire. We've been up to the Peacock Gym half a dozen times. I mean, that's a that's an eight-hour day. I mean, it's like a, 
260 mile round trip yeah. you know what I mean yeah. all these people don't realise what's gone into this I mean for Josh Kelly to do that I mean if he was genuinely ill then and then I, I'm going to apologise for what I'm saying here. if he is genuinely ill then then obviously I, I mean he didn't want to fight and didn't, didn't want to risk losing his own then I understand that but if David was a normal kid that come to the gym and was living in England and pulled out, I mean, it's still bad enough, but he's from Russia, you know what I mean? We've, he's flew over from Russia. He's spent, we've spent hours and hours travelling the country for sparring, you know what I mean? And, mm. and, and loads of efforts going into it. Neil Marsh has worked so hard behind the scenes as well, his manager. I mean, this is a guy from Russia that we ended up bringing over. I got the. I was fortunate to end up training, and we've had some fantastic nights, been in some amazing fights. But there was a lot of money invested in Dave, in David from Neil to get him where he's got, and obviously he's done a fantastic job. And this was a, a you know, what I mean, a, a moment really on Sky TV to show the people that David isn't finished, and I knew he was nowhere near finished. To come and put a great show on, he was really up for it. Um. And, and that is it. I mean, the fight could have probably gone. The part of the fight itself. I mean, you can look at it two ways. He could have gone in there, and Josh Kelly could have boxed David's head off. Mm. But and that's. I mean, that was probably the, the betting favourite for Josh Kelly to win on points. But I know David more than more than anyone as his trainer um, over here, and, and he can really fight the kid. You know what I mean? He can really fight on his day. He does blow a bit on cold. I tell you what, on his day, I mean, you can ask anyone, Kel Brook, all his, all his sparring partners, he can proper fight the kid. And I don't know, I don't know what to say. Yeah, just to remind the listeners, we've got Carl Greaves on the call, a little bit dejective of dejected, obviously. Carl Greaves Pro over on Twitter, Carl Greaves Pro. It's the unfortunate side of the business. Whenever people look and see that, um, you know, Josh Kelly's pulled out, they just move on, watch the show, but they don't realise what Carl is explaining here, the things that go on behind the scenes. You know, it's not just a case of two boxers fighting on the night. There's a lot of preparation, a lot of money, a lot of time and effort put into these things, unfortunately. Just before we move on, Carl, to uh, some of the other guys, David, you obviously mentioned there February is possibly being mentioned. Are you working towards that with David? Will you be looking at other options? Well, you know. Well, he's 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 in he's um well he'll be going back to Russia now. I mean he's having a week in London. He's going to get his visa to America on Monday because he was he wasn't thinking of going over there and trying trying new things out. Obviously, with this fight coming up, coming happening with Josh Kelly, he come back and train with me. Um, and obviously, this was our, our way of getting back into the mix. But I don't know. I think he might he might go to he might go to America now, or he might stay over here and and stay with me. And and, and obviously, want to do this fight with Josh Kelly. I don't know. But Eddie said that the fight will happen in February. I mean, that's down to Neil and Eddie to sort it out. And like I say, I'm just his trainer. But um, they'll sort all that. Out. And obviously, Neil will speak to Dave and see what he wants to do. But will he want to go through all that again? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, just moving on, uh, we, last time we were talking to you, obviously, Carl, we also had Deck Spellman on the call as well. Deck, obviously, um, you know, came back from, obviously, tragic circumstances. He gave his all in the ultimate boxer, didn't he? Do you want us to give us a lowdown on that? I think it was, was that September that took place, was it, the, the, the boxer? Um, no, I think it was, was it, it was November the 2nd. No, it was November the 2nd, right, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, he did really well, didn't he? I mean, obviously, Shaki and Pitt is that one, it was, <laughs> was a bit of a free, really, <laughs> six foot six or seven whatever he is yeah. and, and and he was just so awkward and he was made for the made for the format was made for him really three rounds hard to get to him in three rounds and and deck had had, a, had, harder, had an harder route to get to the final than what he did so by the time he got there he was a little bit tired he had a broken nose he went into the fight into the final with a broken nose but listen deck's a fantastic lad he's got a massive heart can really punch and, and really entertaining and he made the night really I mean his performances was was great um, yeah I love the lad to bits I mean what he's been through to come back um, to do what he did in that was, was fantastic yeah, well done to Deck. He, he certainly did put in a good account of himself. Just finally as well, Carl, we thank you for your time. Let's go on to Sam Bowen. Was supposed to fight yeah. Ronnie Clark, obviously an injury. What's the lowdown on Sam? Well, this is another thing. Obviously, when David come over, his first spa was with with was, was with Sam Bowen. Um, I've never sparred them before together because I know they're both, they're both. I know it was going to be quite brutal, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But 
to be fair to David, he, he I mean, he's, he's, he's a stone over a stone heavier than and then Sam. You know what I mean? When it comes to to, to sparring, I mean, David would have been over eleven and Sam was just over ten, so there was a stone in him. But um, no, it was a great spar. Um, a good eight rounds. It was fantastic to watch. But um, and when the, when Sam got out, got out, he just said, "Bloody hell, mate! My ribs, my ribs killing me, mate! My ribs hurting me." So I just said, "Look, get your send off. Um, let me know how you are tomorrow." Um, he, 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 I messaged him the next day. He said, "I've been up all night, car. I'm in an absolute. I'm in pain. I'm in agony." So I said, "He said I'm going to go to the to the doctors." Um, see what he said the doctors felt around and said look yeah it is you know either put a muscles either come away off the bone or you've cracked it he said but unfortunately we don't x-ray ribs because there's nothing we can do for them so <laughs> what i'm saying here is i've had <laughs> i've lost double money really because i've lost the training fee from david from not fighting and i've lost my manager's <laughs> training fee from sam bowen who's yeah. not going to be boxing next week so it's 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 a crippler really but and one thing i will say is boxers and trainers managers can never ever rely on the money until they're in that ring because this just proves what what can happen you know what i mean so um yeah unfortunately he's out he's injured he's had a good he's well it's been four weeks now i think so he's still not he's still nowhere 100 percent. but i'm hoping he can start by training within a couple of weeks uh, and we're looking at getting the fight rescheduled to, to February. Um, there will be an announcement within the next week or two. Any positives just to close out, Cole, from the camp? Anyone to look forward to? Any wins recently? I know Nina Bradley got a win, yeah. didn't she? Yeah, I mean, I've had, on, on the all, I've had a great year. I mean, obviously, Sam becoming British champion, WBO Intercontinental champion. Nina Bradley, Commonwealth champion. I mean, every fighter, I, I train eight fighters. Uh, I think I've had, I think Deck and uh, Dave is the only two that's been beat all year. So, on the whole, it's been great. The promoting is going well. I mean, it's hard work sometimes, but the promoting is going well. I do, I do 12 to 15 shows a year, building fighters up. I've got, I've got a few kids on the road that, that I manage who, who's causing the odd upset and that. So, on the whole, I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't complain. I mean, Boxing's full of ups and downs. I mean, this is these last couple of weeks has been has been hard. Obviously, with Sam having to withdraw, and obviously what's happened with David. Um, but hopefully, we'll, we'll see the year out, and then next year we'll start on a positive again with with a few wins and, and back to back to normal. Lovely stuff at Carl Greaves Pro over on Twitter. Thanks as always for joining us, Carl. Appreciate it. Yeah, top man. Thank you. All Cheers. The best. Cheers. Bye bye. bye, -bye. That sounds oh, bad. It sounds like he's going to lose his fighter over the back of that, now, eh? Oh, no, it's an unfortunate situation, isn't it, Andy? And like I said to Carl, I was genuinely, you know, that was the step up when I saw Avanesian down that I thought Josh Kelly really needed if he was, Andy, going to push on to these, you know, lofty heights that people were expecting of him. True, and I probably want to bring Rob in here, actually, because it was Rob was actually the one that picked up on, on Josh Kelly. And that this, again, I think he's all flash and maybe partly no substance. Um, you know, what, what the hell's happened within the... But, an hour and a half, a, a dodgy tackle or something like that? Well, if you're going to bring me in, what I'd say, I don't know if the two things are... Statement analysis, sometimes uh, in criminal procedure, they get bring in these statement analysts to uh, see if they uh, basically squealing on themselves with some of the things that they say. Not that that's related, but I watched Eddie Hearn's video last night when he came out and... So I'm assuming he's being pretty well looked after by doctors and stuff like that. How is he getting two viruses in the space of, in the space of two weeks? Um, and I think it's a, it's kind of uh, interesting that Josh Kelly himself didn't jump, come out and jump on an IFIL and give his perspective. So maybe there's more to it, the rumours than they're saying. But in terms of him being flashed, like I mean, like I said at the time, they were ranting and raving about him hitting a guy five left hooks in a row. Show me the show me the fella that gets hit with five left hooks without ducking. You know what I mean? So that was the caliber of opponent he's been fighting so far. Like I think it's they put they put labels on him like he's the he's the next Roy Jones. Like well, that's a big that's a huge ask. Like a monumental task for a fella that we don't know if he has that kind of ability yet. So yeah, interesting one to say the least. There's one thing that doesn't sit right with me. And that's the fact that Adam Booth attended a rules meeting 90 minutes before his fighter pulled out of the fight. Yeah. Now, you're not telling me they expect him to sh 
get rid of this virus in 90 minutes, surely. I mean, the, the fact that he's, he's attended the rules meeting is just downright disrespectful. Um, and, and it's just, it's pig ignorant, it's disgusting. And, and like you say, like, a lot of fans will not understand the time, money, expense that goes into camps. Like I said, this guy's come over from Russia. 30 year old, coming off a loss. Exactly, yeah. And this was a huge opportunity for him. It, it sounds bizarre, really, that what's Josh Kelly now? Is he, what, 9-0, and something like that? 10-0. Uh, and 0. How big an opportunity this was for uh, David Amanesian. And I think it was a great fight and one that I think now that I've made the mistake sometimes of going with the amateur, going with the kid who's got all on paper, looks brilliant, but in reality, in reality hasn't had the test. Avanesian has boxed at uh, has boxed at world level, and while he's not always come out on top, he's had that experience. Now he's by no means washed up either. And when he saw it, he was priced at ten to one. I thought, what a good price this is for this guy. We've not seen Josh Kelly take a shot yet. Never, never mind. I'll go in with someone of this caliber. And then, like I say, to, to attend a rules meeting and then withdraw ninety minutes later is just it just doesn't seem right. Why why is he turned up if they've no intention of fulfilling the fight? Things like that just don't sit right with me. Just if you do need to pull out, just just withdraw. Just just pull out in the morning. You know if you're ill. It's not just something you're gonna shun, you know, if you've got like a bad stomach and you can take that fucking L four tablets that'll bung you up. If you've got a virus, it's not just gonna go walk about and say, Rita, I've had enough now, I'm a, you're not gonna be ill anymore. If you're ill, you're ill. So it's it's it stinks. The whole situation stinks. The fact that he's only got a fraction of the purse it, again is just a joke. I mean, Eddie Hearn talks about all he's got all this money and stuff like that. We'll pay the guy then. As far as he's concerned, he's fulfilled his part of the deal. He's weighed it. He's weighed in. He's made the weight. What else can he do? The whole situation is reliant on the other fighter. He's pulled out at fucking what one o'clock something like that. 12, 1 o'clock, and he's going away with what some expenses for a training camp. It, it just does not sit right with me whatsoever. Okay, Ozzy, let's bring in our second guest of the evening. Delighted to have our friend Steve Wood on the call. How are you, Steve? Yeah, very good, thank you. Just come back from the Scouts Jolly Boys, so uh, I'm getting ready to go and watch the uh, the finals of Celebrity Get Me Out of Here. All right, so it sounds like you're enjoying yourself then. What about Kel Brook last night? Did you enjoy that? Do you know what? I had my own show in Bolton, so I didn't get a chance to see it. I spoke to a few people and they said uh, he didn't look as good as um, he has done in the past, yeah. No, no, he, did, he didn't look great, no. We were just talking about, uh, we were just talking with Carl Greaves, actually. But let's just move on to your fighters, shall we? Josh Warrington, Carl Frampton, December the 22nd. How's the preparations coming along, Steve? Yeah, everything's go going fine from uh, J Josh's side, yeah. I mean, um, he just does the same things for all, all his fights, obviously. As, as the years have progressed, he's had to like up his training levels. But, you know, it's the same as he did for the Selby fight. We've had good sparring and uh, all, all, all the times uh, have been improved on. So, yeah, I mean, Josh, Josh is flying and the 22nd guy not come quick enough for us. Josh is obviously the champion. If he were to get the win over someone of Cole Frampton's pedigree, plus he's beaten Lee Selby this year, I tell you what, it's not too shoddy, is it, For you know, from Josh's point of view? No, it's not. And, you know, like... We didn't have to take this fight. People's got to realise that uh, we picked this this fight, and the, the reason being is, you know, he is a world champion, but he's not got the respect that that he should have done for being a world champion. Even when he beats Carl Frampton, it, it, he'll not just be a world champion; he'd be a league world champion, and uh, that's that's why we've chose Carl. Uh, what about Terry Flanagan, Steve? We haven't spoken to you since his fight against Regis Progre. He gave it a good go, but Progre is pretty pretty good fighter. Yeah, to be honest with you, we knew he was a good fighter, but um, he ended up being better than we thought he was. I mean, his upper body movement just meant that Chaddy struggled to, to get the jab off and everything would come off with, with, with a jab with Chaddy. So um, he got beat and, you know, he wasn't as bad as the scores shown, you know what I mean? It was a, it was a reasonable close, close fight, but, uh, you know, he did, he, he did get beat. But, you know, he's he lost to, to what could be the best, 
Yeah, you, do you think then that program will go on, hopefully, fight the likes of Josh Taylor, who you got for the winner of the World Boxing Super Series, if it goes yeah, ahead? You know, you know? What? I, I think that's probably a, a 51-49 fight, because we really rate Josh Taylor as well, but uh, it, if it comes down to the power, I, I, I think uh, Bogas um, punches harder than Taylor, you know what I mean? So um, I think he'd just be slight favour, but you couldn't ride Taylor off on it, and I think... You know, if they do get to the final together, which I expect them to do, uh, it'll be an absolute fantastic fight. Just looking back at one of your cards that you put on recently, Steve, Friday the 30th of November in the Olympia in Liverpool, you had uh, Sean Cairns obviously lost, Jamie Collins lost, you put in Tom McGuinness against Colin Day against one another. Any thoughts from that show? You obviously threw the guys in against each other there and a couple of unexpected defeats as well. Yeah, well, listen, um, I said that to the guys last last night, you know, I had a show in Bolton and uh, I got 12 out of 12 and some of them were tough fights, but a lot of them were in the easy ones against the normal uh, journeyman and it's okay, one, two, three, but I've got kids who's had five or six fights now and uh, we're not doing that in 2019, I've told them they're going to be fine kids. Uh, probably from their own VIP stables and uh, that's just the way it is and the, the truth is if you don't want to step up and have 50-50 fights you are getting the contract back we, we're not messing about next year yeah, I was thinking that whenever you go to some of these shows, it's okay maybe having five or six fights where the lads are fighting against journeymen or possibly Latvians, but you really need that 50-50 fight, at least one, don't you, to keep the interest? Of course, and it helps sell the tickets as well because, you know, the supporters come and watch them and the first two, three fights have go, but when they, they're just fighting nobbies, the supporters don't want to come and uh, I can understand that as well and it's doing no good for the, the fighters. The fighters need to... Uh, you know, be challenged and, and, and improve. And if they want to do something, they've got to do that. And, uh, you know, like last night, we had a lot of them who, you know, didn't sell enough tickets to cover four rounders yet. They were doing six rounders. So I took an heavy loss last night. And, uh, you know, some of them, you know, just don't get any benefits out of where they were. So I've just said to them, look, if you want to fight on my shows again in the future now, you're going to have to fight someone who's, who's your level and who's selling tickets as well so that, you know, I'm, I'm not just a mug making you a, a professional boxer with a winning record. What about Jack Cullen? Obviously, he's got a few wins under his belt now after going out to Ireland and fighting in the prize fighter thing. Um, talking about maybe Jimmy Kelly fight next or something? Well, to be honest with you, I don't know where you've heard that one from, but um, yeah, I phone Lee Beard up who I believe manages him and... Uh, offered him the fight for this, this Saturday when we were struggling and uh, he said it was too early even though he'd been sparring Cal Brook but he'd consider it um, in the future so I made him an offer for, 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 for next year and uh, that would be a, a, a good British eliminator wouldn't it? Yeah, it certainly would be. Just remind our listeners, we've got Steve Wood on the call, at Steve Wood VIP over on Twitter. What about Isaac Lowe? Got himself a nice little win out in um, America recently? Yeah, I still got to see it yet. I mean, I spoke to Isaac the other day and he, and he said it's on his uh, Facebook feed, but I'm not a great one on Facebook, so I'm going to have to get my son to show me how to do it. But, uh, yeah, he was saying that he uh, he felt great and he boxes as, as good as he ever has done. And uh, I'd like to watch him and I don't know what the level of opponent was that, that um, he had over there, but you know, to win a WBC international fight is a great achievement. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased for him because he's worked really hard. Final points before we let you go there, Steve. What about Lyndon Arthur up at light heavyweight now? What's the plans? Well, we um, was hoping he was getting an eight round on the 22nd, but I've just been told he, he's just a, a tick, up, tick over six. So um, a, after that, you know, um, I was speaking with Frank Warren and saying, look, he's a good kid and, and he's moving in the right direction at the right pace. So hopefully a couple of eight rounders and then... Uh, Get him into a title fight, whether he's an English or one of these uh, internationals, I don't know. But, you know, he, he, he's good enough to, to, to move on now. and we, we want him to, and he does as well. Uh, what about your stable, just closing out the year, and what have we got to look forward to for 2019? Well, we've, we've got some good kids, you know, as I say. You know, like, I mean, Jack Flatley won again last night, and uh, he weighed in at 11, 11 stone bang on. So, um He's come down from the middleweight and, uh, you know, he was um, a good prospect of middleweight, you know what I mean? The fight that he had with um, 
Ty Williamson is, is, is as good as we've seen in 2018, and, and that Ty's a, a top kid and going to go places. So, you know, he's doing that in middleweight, and now he's making light middleweight. Um, he's going to be in the mix, isn't he? And um, Scott Fitzgerald's agreed to fight Anthony Fowler in March. So, um, you know, that sort of level is where um, Jack Blackley is, and he actually beat um, Scott in the, in the ABA. So, um, you know, they're, they're going to fight and maybe the loser could fight um, Jack. Uh, the winner's going to fight Cheeseman and then the winner of them could go back and fight Cheeseman. There's some good, good round robins to be made, yeah. And as we were saying earlier as well, Steve, if you go into a fight like that, you give a good account to yourself, you excite the fans, you may be on TV. It doesn't necessarily matter as much if you lose, really, these days, if you have a good go. You know, I don't follow them, the, the MA. I don't like it, but, you know, I was chatting with someone today and we were talking about the, the same thing, that one of the reasons people watch the MA is the best fight, the best, don't they? And if they get beat, they come back and have another hard fight and uh, they, they fight at the level of that and... You know, we've got to take a leaf out of that in boxing and um, I understand people need building up. But when you get to a certain level, uh, fighting pe people at your level uh, is not a bad thing. And the punters have got so much choice of where they want to go now that they, they're going to stop going to, to the shows unless you put, put them on. So certainly my, my uh, idea for 2019 is having at least two or three of my own kids on each show fighting each other and... Uh, it's quite easy to sell tickets then because people want to come and see a good fight and the kids on the undercard not just come and watch them then because they know there's going to be some other good fights on. So uh, if I'm going to carry on what I'm doing, um, it's got to happen, otherwise I'll just be skinned. <laughs> Final point, uh, Steve, Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder, what did you make of it? Do you know what? He was, he was, he was good for boxing, wasn't he? And, you know, that, that 12th round was a bit scary for... Uh, Tyson, but uh, you've got to give him all the credit in the world for, for getting up and coming through. And uh, at the worst, he'd got a, he'd, he'd got a draw, hadn't he? Po po possibly, possibly, possibly nicked it, but he certainly didn't lose it. Um, I can't argue with a draw. What I can, can argue with is uh, the scoring again, where someone's got um, Wilder winning it by four rounds, which is, is ridiculous. And uh, I think that took a lot of. Um, the, 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 the good positive press away because he's made it a bit negative on it and um, you know Tyson for me took it a bit too early um, so he's only going to get better from that so if you do fight again I think um, it'd probably be a, a clear win for Tyson there you go, everybody. Clear win for Tyson, says Steve, at Steve Wood VIP over on Twitter. Thanks for giving us your time, as always, Steve. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, no problem, Steve. Thanks very much, now. Cheerio, all the best. Cheers, bye, bye. Steve Wood there, promoter, matchmaker, manager, all of the above, good for boxing. Smido, sorry, I cut you off earlier. I know you were looking to get in on a point, possibly on the Kelly Avanesian thing, was it? Go ahead, Smido. Yeah, can you hear me that? Can you hear me yeah, that, Steve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say a couple of extremes, really. Um, one to possibly stick up for Kelly, or not stick up for him, but give, give the other side of the story. Maybe um, he was trying everything in his power to... to to go ahead with the fight, um, but it took someone at the last minute, whether that be a doctor or his, his dad or God knows, to say, you know, come on, lad, you can't, you can't box you in the state. Um, but the other flip side of that is that um, him and Adam Booth might have had a raging fallout. Um, I don't know because, like casual corner as I am, I looked at the card Wednesday, um, and frankly, that fight um, was the best fight on the card, um, better than the main event. On paper, um, it was a good step up for Kelly, and as we've as we've all agreed to, um, David's you know operated and, and had a go at, at world level on on more than one occasion. It was a, I felt it was a good step up and good matchmaking, frankly. But obviously, obviously, it's not gone ahead, um, and it sounds like the guys have not been um, not been treated the best. But you know, as we've said, it's a real indictment of of what it is like day to day as a um, an opponent or a, a promoter, manager that's not got a TV deal. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting listen, and it, it, we've had a couple of good calls tonight. It's, it's interesting. Sorry, jumping on this, but it's interesting to know what them...
might have fallen out about because um, as Carl Greaves said there before that he had trouble making 147 before they were talking about making it at 150. So if he's looked bad at the way in, it looks to me like he's done the weight all wrong. And I wonder, is that what they're fighting over? His, you know, boot legs, his fighters to be tuned in and dedicated to the cause, so to speak. And maybe Kelly's, I, I'm only, I'm only kind of, you know, uh, given what it looks like, might look like from the outside. I don't know what's going on in their camp, but it looked to me like he did the weight wrong. I don't know what everyone else thinks. I wonder. I wonder if the uh, with Adam Booth, if the Ryan Burnett situation impacted his thoughts at all, because I don't think Burnett was one hundred percent fit going into this fight. I mean, like we said, I heard a couple of weeks before that that at one point both Denair and Burnett were out of the fight. Obviously, it didn't happen. But then I know for a fact that. Burnett was scheduled for two weeks sparring with an English fighter and he could only fulfil one week and he had to withdraw from the second week and that was in the run really not far off fight week. So maybe if Kelly isn't 100% fit, whether he's botched the weight, etc., things like that, I wonder if Booth's, Booth's consideration from where Kelly, not Kelly, sorry, where Burnett wasn't maybe 100% going into the fight, if Kelly wasn't 100%, maybe he's thought, actually... We're not having or, any of this. Or is it the training? Because there's Dave Allen apparently pulled out of the, the, that camp as well. So wow. he's wanting to remain oil, loyal to his previous trainer. But again, we all, kind of, <laughs> we all expected to happen, didn't we? Eh? But, <laughs> I, can't, I, can't believe, I can't believe you've just used Dave, Dave Allen as an example for a trainer. Uh, no. <laughs> Dave <laughs> Allen's one of the stars in British boxing. I mean, he need, Dave Allen needs to be referenced every week. Well, the thing is, Dave Allen says he had to take it seriously. He goes to Adam Booth, who's known to be a hard taskmaster. I mean, Christ, David Hayes' body was crippling him every time he went into a training session. You know, clutch school fights, fucking, you know, the latter half of his career was all done because he was, you know, the, the way he was trained by Booth or whatever. And that. I mean, that guy went from a skinny cruiserweight to a jacked fucking heavyweight, by the way. Cause Andy, you've got Hay, you've got Bennett, you've got Kelly, Adam Booth, scything him down like a hitman here. Yeah, fucking, well, I suppose the only one that kind of survived was George Groves, and even that the relationship kind of, you know, melted pretty well, not so much quickly, but it melted in mysterious circumstances. Well, Billy Joe Andy was Lee, in Andy and Lee. out there, wasn't yep. he? Andy Lee, Chris Eubank. Chris Wonder Eubank, that. yeah. Remember Andy Lee at 154? Michael Yeah, I thought that was a mistake at the time. Talking. I thought that was a big, 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 big mistake at the time. And you know what? I I don't want to speak on, on Andy's career or whatever like that, but he'd never been off his feet until that fight. And then after that, after he lost the weight and came, went back up to middleweight and Lotus, he was going over a lot more often. I don't, know if, I don't think necessarily think it was a step up in opposition because he fought good guys before. I think that kind of took something out of him. That, that, yeah, uh, he's six, lucky to get six he pounds. Was that a draw? I think he got yeah. in that fight. Draw? No, he got he he knocked out John Jackson and then. And got a draw on a Peter Quillen fight. No, see, see that fight on 154 in Germany, uh, in Denmark. Was that a draw? Oh, yeah, that was against Frank Hoshe Hotel. Oh, he? sorry. I thought he only fought, fought once in 54 against John oh, Jackson. Uh, yeah, oh, I remember. No. Yeah, oh, there was. Yeah, yeah, I remember. That was Booth. That was his first fight with Booth at 154. Eh? I, didn't like I think what we can what we can say about Booth is, and I've said this before, I think he's the most calculated um Deliberate, selfish. Yeah, I agree with um, you. And, but all of which is not a bad thing if you're if you're a fighter of or with Adam Booth. He is the most calculated ma uh, trainer manager in, um, in in British boxing for me. Um, we saw what he's done for Hay. That was you know a lot of a lot of deliberate uh, money grabs and fa fake beefs left, right, and centre. Um, Groves was pretty similar along the way, very, very deliberate the way they campaigned. Um, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Adam Booth pulled the plug at half an hour's notice, never mind eight hours' notice. Ozzy, do you have anything to add there before we move on? Um, no, no, I've said my piece on, uh, on Booth, Kelly and the whole situation. No problem. Just finishing off the Lomachenko undercard, uh, Tiafimo Lopez, as we discussed last week, knocked out Mason Menard. Uh, that was a little uh, highlight reel knockout for Lopez. And yeah, let's move on then, shall we, to this Sheffield card. Smith, I'm going to go to you first. Actually, we've spoken about a few of the fights already. We discussed the fight that never was. Kelly against Avanesi and Anthony Fowler got a first round knockout win, a facile first round knockout win. It has to be said against Jose Carlos Paz. Didn't see Kid Galahad. John O'Carroll, decent scrap with Guillaume Frenois, Smido. A few people saying that they felt the Frenchman was maybe hard done to. Andy Lee, I know, scored it a draw. It ended up as a, a draw on the cards as well. 
And then Kel Brook, I mean, where do you start with this Smido against Michael Zarafa? I am of the opinion, firmly of the opinion that Kel Brook has no interest in boxing whatsoever and they're just trying to string him Ooh. along. You could, you could just imagine it though, Smido, couldn't you? Come on, Kel, you know, Sam, we'll get this calm fight, nice payday for you before you retire. I don't I don't know, is it even there for Brook anymore, Smido? You're Eddie here, he's asking to jump. Get him off the cooking. On last night's evidence, Steve, the answer to your question is simply no. Um, I for as long as I can remember or as long as the fight's been talked about was a was a, in the Kelbrook camp in regards to um, who I would pick between him and Amir Khan. As of last night, for the first time, I would pick Khan. And it pains me to say that because I think Khan's a prick. Um, Brooke was shocking last night. He was terrible. Um, it was just eating right hands. I mean, if that Zarafa had, you know, 10 or 15% more power and a bit of a better gas tank, Kel Brook's career could be over today now. Like... Is, is he? I mean, he started the first round. The, in the, within the first minute, he kind of rocked Zarafa. And I thought, oh, Con, you know, he's found his distance there. Um, I've always liked his left hand. He can throw it as, a, as an orthodox jab or, or a lovely left hook. Um, I thought he got off to a great start. Um, but then from the second round onwards, he was struggling for the distance. He didn't throw as many jabs as I would like to see him. Um, he, like I say, eating punches all night long, eating right hands. I mean, this, this, this Aussie fella's not, you know, the most sophisticated boxer you're ever going to see. A bit of a loop in right hand, and he's just been eating them all night long. Um, face busted up a little bit. Um, I think that um, Kel Brook's face will break again by the end of his career. Well, it'll probably signal the end of his career when it does. I think someone will break his face again um, for the third time. Um yeah, just it's just not there, Steve. And it it's coming in at one fifty, and then they're saying he's making a statement. I mean, who gives a shit, really? Like, I, yeah, I just don't really get it. I just thought it was it was it was tough to watch. It was tough to watch because, I've, as I've said about Kel Brook before, he's got um he's got world class tendencies or has shown world class um flashes of world class for, throughout his career. But um I think he's been badly um um badly matched um. And he's obviously there's all sorts gone on his career. I just think it's getting on the verge of a waste of talent. There was a there was a a tweet last night. I forgot who said it. It was one of the boxing writers. I'll need to give him credit at some point. Um, Kel Brook's second best win is between um, Senchenko. It was Mark Butcher uh, between Frankie Gavin Senchenko or um, that Jones fella who we fought twice. That's not a good indictment of Kel Brook's career. Um, he's got he's got that one good win over Sean Porter that actually looks better now than it's probably ever done. Um, but last night it was just it, it was it was tough to watch as someone who was not like a Kelbrook fan, if you like. But I've got the, the I've got the foundations there to be a Kelbrook fan if he was fighting the right kind of people and saying the right kind of stuff. I, you know, I just, just me though, Am I right in saying that last night was supposed was a one fifty four fight and Brook has come in at one fifty to make a statement that he can still get down to welterweight? Am I get, is that right? Yeah. That's that's what the I that's what that's, that is. I couldn't that's what the narrative saying. But I just, I, I think that's silly. I think that's. I mean, Kel, so because this could have happened. At the no, start it's of, not that. He's, he's trying. He's trying to come down as light as possible because he's trying to maintain the weight. He's trying to make one forty-seven in the sheer fucking hope he's on his knees. He's willing to take his cock and balls in his mouth. That Amir Khan says, "Yep." Let's get this one one forty-seven. That's yeah. the reason why he's fucking maintaining that weight. The only sole reason he's doing it. I just think Khan's laughing at him, mate. Like, and I've had a go at Khan numerous times over this situation, but I think Khan's laughing at him. I think he's taking the piss. He's, he's just adding... He's adding. I mean, how many layers or loop or hoops has he, has he put in place for, for Kelbrook to, to apparently jump through? I mean, we're going back years. Fight at world level or win a world title or do, or do this or do that or make 147 and rehydrate and, and walk in second. And Kel Brook, I've already said this before, publicly, the way that Kel Brook's done this negotiation publicly, he's embarrassed himself. And he embarrassed himself last night by saying there's one thing that they're still, they're still quibbling over, apparently. And he's, ad- and, he's, and he's admitted to accepting that last night, the rehydration. I just, I just think that there's been, I reckon there could have been a conversation at the start of last week whereby they've said, right, as you wait, yeah, Dan. <laughs> Um, we'll t- let, let's try and get as low as possible and we'll give that a bit of a narrative. That that um, So at the start of the week, losing that extra... So he's, let, he's, he's come £4, in on, four pound less than what he could have done legally or within the rules. That extra £4 that's come off, that could be of detriment to his performance. 
it probably has been of detriment to his performance in the ring. So he's took he's took you know all them right hands, um, possibly as a result of, of of you know doing too much on the on fight week when he should be winding ta- down. They're they're more interested in losing four pound or more to to make a, a statement on the scales. I mean, come on. I mean, who's, who was the last time that, that, that scales were used to make statements? You do your goddamn statements in the goddamn ring. Well, Smido, you obviously didn't listen to Bellew of the Week last last week because, as me and Donny were discussing, the weigh-in and, and the scales is part of the Razzmatazz boxing now. Well, I did actually listen to the podcast last week, yeah. Um, but no, I mean, yeah, I was just, I was really disappointed. Um, a lot of people were now saying, um, and rightly so, that they're losing interest in, in the Khan fight. I think Khan's laughed at him. Uh, Khan's got no loyalty to to um, Eddie, he's definitely got no loyalty to Sky um, or Kel Brook. And, and if he can... Like, because I watched Hearn's interview and he was saying something along the lines of, this is a legacy fight. It's not, it's not a legacy fight. It's something that should, that should have happened in, in terms of the eyes of British fans. Going over to America and having a chance at beating a pound-for-pound pound, uh, top kidder, that's a goddamn legacy fight and a legacy potential win. But obviously, fighting Crawford is, um, or beating Crawford is, is considerably less likely than beating Brook. But you've got to be in the race to win it. So, <laughs> it, you know, if it, it, you know, we all think that Crawford would would beat Khan. But at least Khan's saying, I'm giving him credit, and I don't like giving him credit. At least Khan's saying, I'll go and give it a go. Smith, just before I bring Andy in, Carl Foch watch was was brilliant last night. Adam Smith bought him in perfectly, and Carl, and you're thinking, what, what's, what, 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 what's Carl going to come up with? Smith, he's ruffling his papers, he's going through his papers, he's going to hit us with a stat. Well, says Carl, Zarafa's 26 years old, so he's coming into his prime. Do you know what? Do you know what? The funny thing about that is, speaking of statement analysis, Eddie incriminated himself and Carl Foch in one of his eye films when he's talking about the just before the fights last night. He said, uh, he got a text message. And he was like, oh, sorry, that's Carl Frotch there. He's, uh, he's asking me for some things that he can say in his commentary. And he's like, he always does that. So he's just recycling this guy out of it. He's like, say this, so far is a tough <laughs> operator. Well, he's a tough operator. It's like he's beaming him in. He's like, hold on there, Carl. I just, hold on, I'm just scrolling down. Yeah, yeah he's but a tough competitor. Add, add You've got Adam Smith there talking like he sounds like he's got fucking four days with a shite trying to get out through his fucking shite pipe. Andy, Andy, it would have oh, been so, funny. It'd been so but, funny if if Carl had uh, you know, gone over the the Eddie line and said, "If you want to see how good this Rafa is, then go and watch the Peter Quillen fight." I wish I, had, I wish I said the tweet actually, but I mean, fuck's sake, it was it was criminal. I mean, they must have used about nine, possibly fifteen excuses as to why Kill Brook looked absolute dog shit last night. I mean, the, the, the best one was this, actually. Has Kel, has, has, has Amir Khan basically go into Kel Brook's head by coming out like a week before the fight to say that he's going to take the Terence Crawford fight? I mean, come on, a fuck. Kel Brook is, oh, you know, last night was just a indictment of what's actually happened here. He has washed, he has, agree, Steve, I agree with everything you just said. He's not even interested in boxing. Eddie Hearns, what I've been hearing, has pulled this guy off the fucking couch. He is in a bad way. He needs to get himself fucking sorted out mentally. He's just no fucking in it. You know, I that must be smiddled with a the kid there, but I, I didn't want to go fucking too heavy in here, but at the end of the day, I've said this for, for long enough. Amir Khan should retire, right? I thought I saw enough before his last fight, the way he was talking. He's got brain damage. In my opinion, there's some concern for what I'm hearing. Possibly he's forgetting things. Kilbrook has just said that he's, no, he's just no fucking interested. So why do you want two guys who optimally are not even at their best on pay-per-view? It's the simple, clearly, there's a simple answer to clearly that. Clearly fucking us over. Fucking over the casuals as well. Pay-per-view. Yeah, fucking over the casuals at the same time who want to see this fight, who are building this fucking narrative. This fight exists in the British conscious because Eddie Hearn, Matt Room and Sky keep it in your fucking conscious. I am here to tell you that fight is not even worth the fucking... They whipped off my piss, right? I want to see if if Amir Khan insists on fighting, I want to see him in a meaningful fight. So that means Terence Crawford, who by the way needs a name fighter. And people who yeah. say that this is another thing is this. You know, why why is why is Bob Arm making three million dollar offers to Danny Garcia but making five million dollar offers guaranteed to Amir Khan? Simple fact is this, Amir Khan is going to bring more interest than fucking Danny Garcia is to affect against Terence Crawford. Because any other fight apart from Crawford and Spence is not even worth, or sorry, uh, I, Crawford, Crawford and Spence is the only fight worth, worth it I can see at that weight at 147. 
right? You know, Garcia coming up obviously as well. That's 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 totally relevant at this point. But Amir Khan should take the Terence Crawford fight if he wants to go down as a potential Hall of Famer, right? I, I'm not going to say he is, but is this a, this is a fact? Is this if he can somehow beat Terence Crawford? What a statement that would be, right? And I tell you another thing: people for, uh, forget about this. Amir Khan was out boxing and winning the fight against Canelo until he got fucking clipped. If he was managed to fucking keep his head about him, no matter the technical def- uh, technical mistakes that he always does, he throws shots for, sh- for weird distances. Take the Garcia fight, he threw an upper uh, an upper cuff in mid distance and got counted with the left hook. He always makes sloppy defensive mistakes. If Amir Khan can somehow keep a defensive mindset and uh, while still keeping his, his shots together, straight shots, jabbing, punching and stuff. There's no against the problems. Uh, there was a possibility he could he could win a fight against a top fighter. Should it against Can Crawford, I think a different gravy. He would probably win the fight. But I'm saying this now: make 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 a decision. What do you want to do? Do you want to go and fight fucking Brook and have like two months of fucking uh, debates and talks about weight and fucking purses and all this bullshit? You know you're going to get who you hate Eddie uh, Hare uh, anyway, regardless. Or, or 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 go write your name in history. You've got a five million uh, five million dollar guaranteed. Offer on the table with a third world title or the back end on your third weight division. Go take it. If you've got enough money to say you can walk away just now, if you've got enough money to walk away for the sport just now, walk away, Amir, because I want you to retire because you sound different. That's all I'm going to say. But if you want to continue, go for greatness, go fight Terence Crawford, go fight for the five million dollars and the third world title. And Eddie has the nerve. The nerve to say on these Eiffel interviews that the cro- that the, the Brook fight's a bigger fight for Khan. Than Crawford. No, it's not. It's for well, he says title. it's for double saying, the well, world title. Not... Yeah, but well, the world title doesn't matter all of us. It doesn't not. Yeah. Doesn't that's not what we're so we're in it. We're, we're, we're wanting to see two fellas who are past their prime in it just to fulfill a pay per view date for you. He's already said, I don't want any part of the Bob Aaron promotion. I don't want any part of it. I want him to fight Brooke. Well, you don't want your fighter to go and fight for a world title. <laughs> you know, this is just like he's not even he's so shameless with it now he's just telling us the, the you know narrative why, like. you know why because Eddie Heard if he can make the Karen Brook fight he keeps any profits and any money he can earn in house he takes yeah. it abroad Bob Arm gets one over the fucking top of him and Bob Arm says fuck you you be Fauntleroy English prick I mean why would Amir Khan take the Brook fight over the Crawford fight it doesn't make sense it doesn't make any sense Crawford is arguably the number one pound for pound fighter in the world a win against Crawford does what for put, it makes him a legend it makes him a legend. Nobody thinks Amir Khan could beat Terence Crawford. We all think Crawford. But but if he could pull it off, like Andy said, he, he'd finish the sport on a legend. WBO welterweight title for a 47 when nobody thought he could win a 47. Why would he fight Brook? Why? A risk losing that fight and the Crawford fight goes away. He can, he might never get to fight for a world title again. Let's be honest. What? Are, who else is calling him out? Oh, Spence is a joke. He's not going to fight Spence. Sorry. No, no, you're okay. It's, 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 yeah. it's, it's, it's weird because you've got you've got Khan, for example, who for you know, I, I, I wound them up big style about fucking chasing the Mayweather fight. But let's see chase the fights. You know, let's see chase Pacquiao. Did we see fucking Brook chasing like you know Charlos and Heard and all that sort of stuff? No, he's the one that's calling you Amir Khan when he's lying sparkle against fucking Canelo. That's the fucking mentality of him. Jose, people yeah, are no, happy. Sorry, just gonna people- People aren't happy. Sorry, Rob, I'll bring you in a minute. People aren't happy what they saw last night. Rob Barnett got in touch with me, you see, Ozzy. He said, um, Hearn has got nominated for Bellew of the Week for dishing this shit up. This is now what a standard uh, Saturday non-pay-per-view looks like. An utter shower of shit. Embarrassing. So, I mean, I just want to get your opinion on that, I suppose, for getting in about the main event, the cards as a whole, Ozzy. I mean, is this the type of fare that's being served up? Are you happy with this? Because Rob Barnett isn't. No, it's, it's garbage. Utter garbage. And... We hear it all the time. Uh, I mean, pre, pre uh, Josh Kelly, Devin Amonesi, and Paul Ace. It's a great card. We've got Kel Brook in against Michael Zarafa. Let's just sum up that Michael Zarafa should have been fighting. Card. He should have been fighting Anthony Fowler for the Commonwealth title on this very card. And the fight wasn't made, and he's gone in as a main event against Kel Brook. Now, in my opinion, that sums up the level what Michael Zarafa is at. That the fact is that eight and zero Anthony Fowler and Dave Caldwell picked this guy for a vacant Commonwealth title fight. The Carol Frenoir fight is a good fight. I think that's perfect for a Sky uh, Saturday night and an IBF uh, final eliminator for a world title. 
cannot complain about that whatsoever. We then get to this stage. We've got Anthony Fowler, Kid Galahad, Kaiser Afshak. Who cares? These are not big names. Like, just because they are a name doesn't mean just because they're against some knockovers means it, it that they're a brilliant addition to a card. Who cares? Put James Tony on the card then. Put him in against some fucking pig. It doesn't bo it doesn't boost the card because it's James Tony. People want to see competitive fights and James Tony versus Dave Allen coming up 2019, baby. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> fucking Tony is all beaten yeah. by the way. But no, but I, I always say like I, I don't get why promoters don't just do the simple thing. Area title fight, English title fight, British mid world level like European and then a top of the villa as well. Because like like I said, the area level, the English level fights produce the better fights because they're competitive. And that's all people want to see. I don't care about the names on the card. I could not care if I've never heard of them. If there's six competitive fights that I enjoy, then I'm happy, regardless of the names. I couldn't care about Anthony Fowler in with another... I mean, they, they built this as, up as a big step up. I mean, this guy, I, I don't know how much notice he's had. I mean, he got wiped out against uh, Jean Mungir, and I think in about four rounds, something like that. There's enough British... To, I mean, he's in against Scott Fitzgerald now, I think, in March. Ozzy, April. on the point of Fowler, actually, just while you're mentioning that, because yeah. we had a question in from David Peach, and he was uh, saying again, Fowler hit his opponent three times while he was down. Not good enough? It's not good enough. I mean, let's have it right. Anthony Fowler should have a loss on his record, and that was from his pro debut. Twice as well. Yeah. He, he, should, he should have been thrown out and... But Jinder Singh in the Commonwealth Games again did the same fucking yes. thing three times on the floor. Yeah, I was there. I saw it. Fucking so, absolute. Ah, doesn't matter. So he, he should be. Uh, let's have it right. He, sh he should have been. Quite quite frankly, he should have been thrown out. And we need to see officials clamp down on this, regardless of whether it's Anthony Fowler, the Olympian, or two and zero John Smith from Bolton, who is an absolute nobody. If you break the laws of boxing and the rules you should be thrown out or have points taken off. Because regardless of your name, if you infringe the rules, you gain an advantage over your opponent who on the floor is defenceless and quite rightly, you should be punished for it. And all too often now we're seeing officials not stamp down on it. And injuries can happen from this. A defenceless fighter on the floor, if they take three or four shots where they're not defending themselves, it can cause some serious damage. So yeah, I mean he's got history for it, no doubt he'll he'll do it again, and I think it's going to get to a certain level from where the referees have no chance whatsoever. Apart from they need to clamp down on it and uh, either chuck him out or or take points off it as well. But not as the card as a whole, very very disappointing. I think I can only remember probably two cards worse than that from Eddie Hearn. One was in Newcastle where we saw the uh, Anthony Joshua against Jason. Woo, Gavin, and uh, I think that was one of the probably one of the worst cards of all time. Jetta Eubank was bad, wasn't it? Yes, and Jetta Eubank as well. Was that, that pay per view that one as well? No, no. it was no. No, no, that should have been Brooke oh, Shadwick. It, that. it was Quinlan, that's what it was. Renlin Quinlan, I Quinlan was pay per view. Oh. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah it, Brooke Chavez was the headline event for the Jetta Eubank fight, but uh, Brooke pulled out, I think. 10 days before or something like that with broken ribs. So that ended up topping the bill on the sky, uh, on regular sky. But no, I mean, I, I think we've seen interviews before, haven't we, where we're seeing like all this pay-per-view money and the, the profits we make are going to be reinvested into the Saturday night fight nights. In my opinion, since that interview, the Saturday night fight night cards have only got worse. They have only well, Ozzy, got... it's, the, it's the appropriate time for the weekly reminder oh, that Eddie Hearn... Well, has not shown a British uh, fighter in a world title fight on regular Sky this year at all. On what, about, what about what about Yafoy? Was... No, British soil. I don't give a shit what they're doing for tax evasion in Monaco once a year. Um, they've not. It's not been on a British soil uh, world title fight has not been on regular Sky at all this year. And that's for your Sky subscription. Anything above distinctly average is going on pay per view. Um, there was a point made last night that, that Josh Kelly and um, Aviation or whatever his name is fight might end up in uh, on a pay-per-view next year. I wouldn't be surprised at that. Um, Kid Galahad was disappointing last night. He's in an eight-rounder that is basically a sparring session. Um, 
the other, I've got better technique than the kid he fought last night. Um, disappointing that Galahad didn't get him out of there. Um, he ain't that. He he's not that young, Galahad. Like he is, he is smack bang in the who needs him club. You know, he's he's obviously he's obviously got um, the potential to be pretty good. Um, not the easiest to hit, etc. But doesn't hold a, a a title or any real sway or ticket sales or you know, difficult to where you go with him. Fowler, that was again just a just a, a glorified sparring session. Um, the one thing I would say about Brook, um, and I know we talk about the Sky agenda regularly. Um, Dave Caldwell went in on Brook last night. To be fair, um, Frotch said uh, I know he talks a lot of shit, but he said that um, he, he thought Brook was under par. Um, so I don't think there was looking for excuses for Brook. I'll give you that. And didn't the, Brook the, used to train with Caldwell before he left for the Ingalls? Right at yeah. the early stage of his yeah. career, yeah. But yeah. Caldwell made made a fair point. Coldwell said that he went. He admitted that he went in on Khan after his last fight. Um, so why should he treat um, his analysis to Brook any different? And to be fair to him, he did have a. He, he did. He did criti- critique him. Um, but yeah, overall, it's just another another shocking that. I mean, Kel, Kel Brook was one to fifty. Galahad and Fowler were one to a hundred. The most, the most comp- uh, well, the most intriguing fight of the night was called off at eight hours' notice. And when has when has John O'Carroll been been a chief support material for Matchroom? He's not. He's a, he's an afterthought, John John O'Carroll. Like he's like he's been used as an opponent. He's won, so they've they've pushed him. It's, it's like it's similar to John Ryder. He's not. I'm he's surprised not, he went back to Matchroom. To yeah. be honest, yeah, John O'Carroll's Kevin not Farmer's not going to Kevin Farmer's going to retire a millionaire beating up on these fucking British fighters, man. <laughs> well, he, well, he probably is, yeah, because I mean, it's all it's very likely that John O'Carroll, despite last night's draw, um. We'll, uh, we'll go on to fight like... Kevin Farmer. They've already got the they've already Ken, got the date done. But Ken what was said that. Ken said the same thing. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah he did. That, yeah. That, 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 do you know what pissed me off? Like they, they said in the after interview. But bear in mind, this French guy, in my opinion, uh, he, he, won he won the fight. fight. He won the fight. He won the fight by two points, and I thought he boxed really well. And they just literally said after it, well. Yeah, well, we may look at the rematch or John O'Carroll will box him first and then Frenoir will box the winner of that. I'm thinking, well, what was the point of this eliminator then? I'm thinking, you've got the bloody French guy who's just... I'm not saying it was a robbery because it, it wasn't a robbery. It, it was a, it was an extremely close fight. But just to say, well, John O'Carroll will probably box him anyway. You think, oh, what the fuck was the point in that? What, what was the point? It was an off decent fight, Eddie wasn't it? Really? Rock up, right? They can rock up with it. Was it WBA title? Was that one? Was that IBF? Mm-hmm. IBF, this one. Well, he's got Tevin Farmer on his books, so hasn't he? So exactly. Yeah, Farmer's yeah. fighting Disney. Farmer's yeah. defending against. Yeah, Fonsi. yeah, that's the thing as well. When Eddie Hearn first kind of was kind of breaking into the sport, he was the IBF man, right? Because Carol Fox picked up IBF with his booty. No, can I remember the, the deal he made for, for Joshua to become a heavyweight champion? That was Martin IBF title. It's all of a sudden became a WBA as well at the same time. You never see mixing the WBC much, maybe for the, maybe the French titles. Definitely doesn't deal, deal with the WBO. Not that much. That I can That's recall. Warren and Bob's organisation. Yeah, exactly. Well, let, me, let me tell you something. That's a terrible fight for John O'Carroll now. I know he's going for a world title and you have to, you know, uh, dare to be great, as they say. And I'm a big fan of O'Carroll. Love the self belief, love that he hasn't had an amateur background, but he's only had 17 fights. And he said last night, experience was the difference. He was on like 48 fights, 46 wins or something. So he's no mug, like, even though I hadn't seen him before. I thought he, he deserved an odd. Like, I thought he was just, he did the classier work. Um, but it just shows, like, O'Carroll's only got three knockouts. Like, he's not going to go to the States and knock Tevin Farmer out. Like, and on, based on that performance last night, he's definitely not going to outbox him. So, how he makes that a good fight. He needs a few more to me, like before he takes that. I don't know Carl's what you think. Beard, Rob. Rob, what's your opinion on Carol's beard? They make him. They should make him cut that. Like you know what I mean. Danny, they used to make Danny Williams take his off. Yeah. They said it. Said they make him, made him, made him take five inches off it last night before the fight. But it still seemed like a bit crazy. Like I don't know. But yeah, no. He looks in good shape, know. Carol. You know. Yeah, like I think that's one of the things about him. He's a gym rat, like, and he loves training. But. Just heard some stuff on um, Ben's channel on, in the build-up saying that he likes to keep his family around him when he's in camp and stuff. I don't know, like, if he maybe might, might need to make a change in that. But I think he's a long way off of trouble in Tevin Farmer. I don't know what the lads think. Like, but I, I don't think he needs to, I'm not saying he needs to make the change, but you, you've got to look at the look, look at the levels he's been boxing at prior to this. Now, this Fremoir has won European titles, etc. things like that, but... His, his best win prior to that is probably Declan Geraghty, who's what mm. a, a fringe British level guy, and he's jumped straight away up to a final eliminator for a world title. And 
we've got this, it, it seems to be the norm now in Britain and the UK and Ireland that if you impress on the domestic circuit, you can just bypass European and fringe world level and you just jump straight up to world level fights. Exactly. Not, and it's it's not like he has no amateur background. Like He, he was fighting uh, exactly, pro in yeah. Australia or something. So or he was living in Australia, came back and saw him pro. So it's not like, yeah. you, you know, he played, he boxed him like city level mm -hmm. in, in Dublin before that. Like, yeah. so, I don't and think I, after 16 fights you're ready for that smoke with Farmer. No, like. I, I like Carroll. I, I think there's a lot to like about him. He's got yeah, a good style. Too, yeah. He's really he's easy on the eye. And he could have won the fight last night and, and he kind of neglected what he, he kind of neglected boxing to basically stand and trade. And the French guy, if he could dig, would have well probably could there was a chance he probably could have stopped him last night because Carroll was eating clean shots regularly. Carroll cuts as well, Ozzy. He, he does, yeah, and this is what I mean about, this is why I always bang on about it, but how key it is to not bypass the certain levels of central area, English, British, Commonwealth, European, and the lads that do it, Josh Warrington is a prime example, he learns all the tricks in the trade, etc, he gets the tough fights, regardless of the level at British, he had a fight with Kiko Martinez, which was like a European level fight, he won the European title, and he gets all these fights under his belts, rather than jumping in at the deep end and coming unstuck, he waits a bit, he gets the fights and experience under his belt, he then goes in with Lee Selby, and he puts in the performance of his lifetime, because he's got the experience, and he's had the fights, and he's had the tough tests, going through the right stages, rather than having this sense of self-entitlement because he's with Matchroom, he's with BT, he sells tickets. I deserve a big fight. Well, why? This was Carroll's got... European title fight then, effectively. This is what it should be. Essentially, yes, Steve. But at the same time, it was for more than the European title because it was for, it's had he won, he was going in for a world title next. No, it should have been, though. I mean, this is what he, he should have gone to European level in yes. your opinion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I is he from Dublin, John or Carroll? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He can't box with the British title. But that's fine. So, yeah, uh, a Fremois and a couple of other opponents would have been ideal. Um, like Rob said, I think he's a little way, way off a world title. Yeah, I agree. Fremois, a perfectly good step up. And he wasn't outclassed either. This is what we've got to remember. It was a close fight. I had him losing by two points around the other way, and it's a draw. For me, th this was his European title fight, and it was close. Like I said, he's got the draw. For me, I'd like now to see him go and don't look at the world title. Yes, it's there, it's dangling in front of you. But when you win when you want to box for a world title, one, you want to win it, and two, you want to retain it. So go and get a couple of fights at a similar level, whether you rematch Frenoir, you'll learn a hell of a lot from this fight. Um, then you go and take one more and then look at Tevin Farmer or whoever holds the IBF belt down the line. Because like I say, the the aim of the game is to win and keep on winning not get your chance, take it, come unstuck, and then you're back at the pecking order. Because, like I say, I don't think he sells a bucket load of tickets. Mm. They're not going to be going to Ireland, so no, 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 it's constantly no. going in the away corner. So, like I said, the wins are key for John O'Carroll. And when he when he does win, he wants to retain the belts he has. Uh, Smid, do you want to say something quickly? Couple, yeah. Um, going into the last round, um, all three, I think all three Sky Pundits had the French lad in front. Um, so that was at least some uh, non-biased non material there for a change. And secondly, uh, Tevin Farmer, if he is not the atypical um, and perfect candidate for a matchroom um, USA fighter, I don't know what is. World champion, they've gone down, uh, you know, he's not a massive star. They've gone down the keep busy route. Remember when he used to sign people uh, back in the day, we used to nick people from Frank or whatever and say, yeah, we're going to keep him b busy. When they come to us, they know when they fight in the next free fight, that all the dates are set out. Tevin Farmer just fits that bill perfectly from a Sky, Sky Match uh, from a Matchroom USA uh, standpoint. OK, thank you, Smido. Uh, right, yeah, just a couple of points just to mop up here. Richard Swig was in touch regarding Lomachenko. He said Lomachenko is incredible. He takes punishment from bigger people like Pedraza and Linares and just brushes it off and gets back to work. The man is unbelievable. A few other bits from the weekend as well. Michel Soro got a second round knockout win over Greg Vendetti. That was interesting, as James pointed out, because the bullshit WBA gold title was on the line. Uh, also, Andy Luis Touton. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. 12 and 0. Ex uh, big yeah. things expected of this guy. Got knocked out unexpectedly by 9 0 and 2. Petro Ivanov in the ninth round. What went down there in France? 
He, he started the fight very quick. He was throwing a lot, a lot of heavy shots and stuff. He was, I think he was just really trying to really make a statement. Uh, throwing a serious a lot of right hands. He was even throwing well with shots to the point where he was actually falling on the floor. Uh, by about the sixth, seventh round, he was. He looked like he, you could tell the gas was running out, of, running out of him. He actually even dropped his opponent. I think it was the, tw- the second or the third round, and then in the ninth, and that the, the guy just turned it around. But you could tell him. I think it was round six, so round seven and eight. Um, I forget which one it was. He was dropped in one of the one of the rounds. He was definitely kind of really struggling to hold on. He uh, got dropped twice in the. In the ninth, then stopped and stuff like that. So that, that was a, that was a big a big shock actually. Um, if I was him, I'd be, I'd be seeking a rematch immediately, uh, and then basically kind of work on uh, just basically just being overly aggressive. That's all he was. He was far far too aggressive in that fight. Really trying to make a statement with the trying to get the stoppage and stuff. So um, in the day, it was I, I wouldn't even say it was a step up for him actually. I say it was a guy maybe on a similar level to that point. He's never really gonna fault anybody. So it is a bit of an upset, so he needs to kind of, I would say, definitely get a rematch made for, uh, for that fight straight away. Um, Michel Soro knockout, by the way, that was that was pretty much, that was an evil knockout, by the way. He's He must be knocking the door for a world title shot at some point as well, sometime soon. Yeah, I would imagine so. Uh, other things of the weekend, if you tuned into Box Nation, if you're a subscriber still, unlike Smido, you would have seen South African action last night from about half five onwards. Thalani Mabenge looks pretty decent to welterweight. He stopped Miguel Vasquez, who's going into gatekeeper mode recently. That was in the 10th round. And the rematch between Thomas Oysthausen and Tabizo Machuno. Machuno getting revenge win, a uh, unanimous decision. Congratulations to him. No doubt we'll see him on the world scene again pretty soon. Also, we had an interesting comment from somebody, which I can't find, so I'll shut up about that and move on. Yeah, let's go on to... Anybody want to make any brief comments? I don't know if Donnie's with us or not. Clarissa Shields against Femke Herman, Cecilia Brakus against Alexandra Lopez, Juan Francisco Estrada against Victor Mendez. There's not really much on this one. As Hater Dave was calling the SPN, the Electronic Sports Participation Network, and I was thinking you could call uh, HBO now, what is it, Horrible Boxing Offering, Andy, I think, after after that last one there. They're bearing out in an inglorious fashion, unfortunately. Any brief comments? Didn't even watch it. I had to actually ask the question because I've seen some picture of Jim Lampley kicking about on Twitter and stuff, and uh, you know, asked the asked the question. I did get the expected answer was that he was crying. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know. I've got the opportunity. I've just been notified that there's a, the files come up for the for the three fights. Uh, it's Thirty gigabytes, so and I ain't gonna go and download that shite. So I'll wait to come up on YouTube. Um, my girl Cecilia Bracus, I know one in points. Uh, the Predator, um, Cecilia Bra- uh, Bracus. Clutter Shields. Yeah. She apparently won um Mrs. Delusional and uh that's about it really I don't know what else I can add to that card, but uh HBO went out basically like flaccid hard on basically. Shocking. Terrible. Yeah, G- yeah, Jim Lampley was crying, Rob. I don't know if you were crying. What do you think of HBO? Horrible boxing offering, you digging that one? Yeah, uh, it's a sad. We uh, we spoke about it. I thought HBO were having their last show about three times this year, so I've already done my HBO <laughs> images. But um, I, <laughs> keeps but clinging on like a dying grandmother, was, doesn't it? <laughs> I know, I know. I'm like, come back, come back to life, like bring us back. Because I'm looking at him last night. Uh, Roy Jones put a picture on his Instagram, and he had him, Lampy, and Kellerman. Like, but something interesting in the picture: Lampy was wearing a pair of jeans. He had the tuxedo up top but he had the jeans down below. I'm wondering, has he been doing this since my, my whole career? And I, his whole career in HBO, I didn't know that he was wearing, really wearing Rob, he has. I'm going, to jump, I'm going to jump in on you, Rob, because I remember once being at a show in Castle Bar and I noticed Jim Rosenthal was pre- presenting with a full suit on and a pair of white night trainers. So behind the camera, these things do go on. That sounds like me if I was going to get married. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, no, I, I mean, look, HBO, legendary broadcast. Like, they probably... Some of the nights like that, like, will never be repeated. Like, they were fortunate enough to have some of the greatest fights we've ever seen, uh, with some of the best commentary moments. Like, so overall for HBO, after forty-five years, a massive thumbs up. But for last night's headliner with Clarissa Shields, two thumbs down. So, yeah. Yep, Rob, not too impressed with that one. Uh, Hopefully you're impressed listening to us. Episode three hundred and three of the Boxing Asylum Nutters podcast. Smidos on the call. Everybody likes a bit of Smido. We've got Rob Kelly as well, Ozzy Smith, Andy Patterson. Donny's on as well. He's been listening in like a stalker. No heavy breathing from Donny yet. He's unable to contribute, but he is listening. He's here with us in spirit, thankfully. Uh, Andy, what about this one? I obviously, don't want to talk about it for too much, but after eight years, 
eight years out of the ring. Last fight was in 2010. Jorge Barrios returns next Friday night in Argentina. Yep, against Adoyilton de Jesus up at welterweight. Come on! Oh, Jorge Barrios <laughs> back again. Is this, was his first fight since when, sorry? 2010. 2010. So I think he's out of jail and stuff like that. Remember we did the bit on him and stuff. Eh? Well, I imagine he's out of jail, I don't know. Jesus Christ, he's coming back. No, but remember, his, his jail sentence apparently got uh, it got delayed. Yeah, he, he, yeah. Oh, I forget. I forget how it went down again. If you go back, listen to the Patreon account and listen to the. But yeah, uh, um, I've no idea who this guy is fighting. Is I don't know where he's from. It sounds like a Mexican with a name you read out there, probably. Even. No, I think he's maybe Brazilian. He might have fought Kid Galahad at one point, unless I'm getting mixed up. Hang on. I just brought up his record here, and Juan Barrios is fighting like a guy. He last fought in 2010, Steve, and this guy is fighting last fought in 2013. He got knocked out against Juan Diaz in five rounds. All right, okay, there you go then. So I think we can just say it's just two short fighters. This is going to be an excellent comeback. Do you think it's going to go well, isn't it, for Barrios, this? Yeah, he should, <laughs> end, he should end up looking fat, and probably coming at middleweight or something like that, you know. Fight Marcus wait. Madonna, what about that? Well, I don't know. Wait, this is it. I just brought it up. It's saying it's well, welter, welter, but, yeah. but, ah, fucking can I see that? Anyway, let's move on, shall we? Next Saturday night, the 15th of December, Joseph Parker returns after his defeat to Dillian White. He's in against Alexander Flores. Also, Junior Farr is in against Rogelio Rossi. Let's see how they get on next week, shall we? Uh, Sonny Edwards, Ozzy, you want to say a word about this? He's fighting against Junior Granados. Is Junior Granados the one? He fought Jamie Conlon in the National Stadium, didn't he? I was at that fight. Correct. That's yeah, it. That was, oh, that was an amazing fight. Also, Daniel Dubois against Razvan Kajanu, Bradley Skeet. This is a, a Frank show. I'm, I'll probably watch this, to be honest. I'll watch it, but again, it's crap. It, it's not a good card at all. It's it's poor. Uh, it, it lost the best fight off it three weeks ago when uh, Sam Bowen, as we mentioned before, had to withdraw against Ronnie Clark. Uh, Edwards Granados, it could be fun, but I think Edwards will just completely outbox him because yeah, he's yeah. he's levels and levels above Jamie Conlon, and I don't see Edwards getting standing in such and trading with Granados. So, who, like I said, proved that he could. He, he had a dig to him because I mean, I mean, how Conlon got up off the floor against uh, off a couple of those body shots, it, it just makes you wonder. That was one of the best fights I was oh, ever at. <laughs> brilliant fight, wasn't it? Really, really good fight. Uh, Dubois, Kajanu. It's not a bad fight for him, really. It, it, we've got to remember the level he's at. The guy's not boxed for a British title yet. I mean, this Kajanu, the way you look at it, he's boxed for a world title. He went the distance with Joseph Parker. Took some rounds off him as well. Got obliterated by Luis Ortiz, so... It'll be interesting to see what Dubois does because last time out he was a bit underwhelming against Kevin Johnson. Proved he was kind of looked like he was a bit of a one trick pony, really, just straight shots, neglected the body, etc. Things like that. So it'll be interesting to see what he's learned from that and whether he can go and take out Kajanu. Uh, aside from that, it, it, it stinks of a bit of a, uh, a small hole show card, really. Uh, some names on it. Bradley Skeet, he's against in, in against an Argent, Argentinian guy. Then you got the lads like Willie Hutchinson, uh, Harvey Horn. That's a potential fight for Sonny Edwards down the line. Ryan Garner, one to watch. Great fighter. Uh, had some problems out the ring, but on the way back. A couple of other guys as well. There's an Irish guy in there, Steve, actually. Not even going to attempt to pronounce his first name. Keevan it, Hines. It begins with a C and ends in an M. And yeah. uh, Aguiar calls his last name. Yeah, Kieran Hines, a, a Graco, I think. Yeah, he used to fight on the uh, Belfast scene. Good fighter, aggressive, be interesting addition to the pros. Glad he signed with Frank. Yeah, I read, uh, I read some of his story and he decided that he wanted to turn over in England because essentially the facilities, uh, sparring opportunities were a lot better than England rather than staying in Belfast. So fair play to the guy. He's, took, he's, took, uh, he's turned pro, moved away from home. I think he's training out of the... Uh, where uh, Bradley Skeet trains now uh, with Alan, Alan Smith. Smith. Yes, yeah, Alan Smith. I'm, I'm sure he's out of that gym. Yeah. So, yeah, it, I mean, the, the card itself is pretty poor. It's not a good card whatsoever, but it's going to be on. I'll watch it. Uh, I like Dubois. I'm a fan of his. 
And uh, I like Sonny Edwards as well, friend of the pod, and really impressed with him last time against Ryan uh, for Rag. So I want to watch him again. But aside from that, the rest is is garbage. Re- really, really poor. Yeah, not too overwhelmed by that Aussie. Davey Coleman was in touch with us. He said, I know you never let him off the hook, but can you please hammer that slime ball Hearn some more this week? He has called Wilder Fury not a great fight, all the while pushing his own bullshit AJ narrative. The same cunt also lied barefaced about contract offers from Finkel. Yeah, Even tricked himself up, Andy. Will the Matchroom FC fanboys ever die out, or is this just boxing now and we have to accept it? Twitter is full of cunts and it's harder to tolerate than ever. I miss pre Eddie boxing, says Davey. He goes on as well. And all this is without getting into the bogus bullshit pay-per-view cards. White versus Chisora, Bellew versus Hay, fucking Kell Brook versus Frankie Gavin. The sport we grew up loving is long, long gone if the masses are willing to accept this shit. David Coleman sounds a bit depressing there, Andy. He fucking does. He sounds like us. Uh, he, he sounds like me when uh, Wilder against Povetkin fell through all that many years ago. He's back in bang on the money, actually. Eddie's been, he's had a nightmare for me, actually, you know, from like Fury Wilder, know what happened to it. Doesn't he sell to it? It does poor pay per view figures to ride the coattails of the fight to then say it's absolute shit and stuff. And oh, I mean, Christ almighty, he's just he's went all fucking balls. And for example, he's even shot on Deontay Wilder for saying there's only one Deontay Wilder, you know, that kind of chant they put in there. But he'd happily fucking put that onto Joshua or any other big ticket sellers that he's got. Him. <sighs> He's just a cunt. That's all he is, man. He's just a pure and utter cunt. And there, there he's got he's got a GQ interview baby. They call him prick face, cunt muscle, fucking Alistair Campbell. You know, Mr. Fucking let's create a war in the rack, fucking cunt muscle. Hey, um, you know, basically saying the questions he voted for Brexit, he's a fucking Tory. You know, it goes with the question, you know, these rich fucking Essex fucking white boys who come for fucking good money are fucking voting Tory. You know, as I said last night, you know, even people from my area, fucking mining, you know, guys who worked on the, on the dust, coal miners, fucking guys who grafted in the precast and stuff like that, guys who made, made good of themselves, made good money, never even fucking, you know, turned their principles and voted fucking Tory, you know, voted for fucking, oh, hey, he's just a fucking prick. You know, the simple fact as well, he's, he's, he's talking about his, his, his show here last night, shutting curtains and fucking Kel Brook deserves 50-50, does he fuck? You know, getting your tickets to GD Sports, 75 fucking quid if you buy a pair of trainers. It was so bad that even GD Sports were handing out fucking free tickets on, on out, out the fucking back door because they couldn't even fucking get cunts to sell their fucking trainers and shit. You know, it's just a, a whole round. He, even, he, even his merit, he, 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 people just need to step up here and say the fact is this. Even the American shows have been shit. Never fact, just forget about his regular scores uh, shows uh, on Sky. We've said it before. Smithers uh, will tell you even better than what I can. They're washed. They're done. They're fucking finished. Some people even thought that Avenition fight was going to push forward to the, the 22nd of December to try and pad out the fucking uh, the white Chisora card. No happening. No happening at all. It's, it's looking like he's going to lose the fight after all. Eh? But um, no, even these he's American shows, you know, this his own thing that's just kicked off now. It's just shit. Shit after shit, and the new the Yanks are starting to kind of understand as to why we're frustrated and why we're getting all these shitty cards because this is what he's delivering you guys. I mean, can you imagine that? I think that fight was in the zone there last night. Am I right in saying that? What were they fucking thinking about that fucking fight last night? Kilbrook against Michael Zarafa. <laughs> and he's embarrassed himself. He's <laughs> absolutely embarrassed himself in the last week. Like he said, even because Coogan, Coogan kind of half pulled him up on it. Was like, come on, like why are you saying that? Like. You're saying that it's a bad fight. You know that it was a classic fight. It was an entertaining. He was like, oh, there was eight punches thrown in the first round. There was 15 punches thrown in the third round, breaking it down round by round. And then he was like, oh, Klitschko (laughs) versus Joshua was a classic heavyweight fight. I'm not having it. That was a classic heavyweight fight. My guy stood and traded. Listen, if your guy could have done what Fiori did to beat Klitschko, he wouldn't have done it. He can't box like that. That's Fiori's style. Eddie Hearn sounded like, like, like a black African-American this week, by the way. I swear to God, they sounded like that. Robert Silver for the Robo Championship podcast. Eric Kelly, who I've got a lot of time and respect for. The Charlos. Wilder came out and said it. I mean, t- t- come on. Floyd Mayweather might be a lot of things, but Floyd Mayweather can see a fight. He could call a fight. Well, at least he should anyway. And even he had fucking fury winning that fight. His dad, Floyd, C- uh, Floyd Senior, was fucking raising it ringside after that decision there. He was fucking shaking his head. He couldn't believe it. Yeah, but no, I got I sorry. <laughs> I thought the same too. And then I looked into it and Floyd Senior thought Wilder won. Oh, and also fuck. Fucking, <laughs> he's back in the crack, is he? He's back in the also, crack. Also said that Wilder had three knockdowns. So I don't know what oh, Floyd Senior seen. Crack. 
definitely on the crack. Wow, well, I mean, come on, the fuck. Hearns had a fucking nightmare fortnight, right? And he said that card there last night. Yeah, it's getting to the point as you either. I, uh, you know, Hearn says it's, it's good for business if other promoters do well and stuff, right? But he goes head to head with Frampton Warren next week. He's a cunt, right? And I hope. Hey, this, okay, I'm going to be cross as a hater, and fuck anybody who thinks I'm a hater and stuff like that, because, you know, I'm sick of his fucking pish. I hope the Tesora fucking card dies a death. I hope fighters start pulling out injured. Illnesses like Josh Kelly, it dies in the fucking box office, and Carol Frampton, Josh Warrington fucking walk right into the ring, sunset or fucking above him, stuff like that, and they make fucking thousands off the top of it. It is fucking shite. He's a fucking prick. And I can't wait for his next fucking car to bomb like last night. You couldn't sell fucking sand to the Arabs there last night. You couldn't sell gin to a fucking alcoholic. He's a fucking washed up has been. He's getting to the point he's old man. If you look at it the last night, is you'd be better putting that fucking fight in a leisure centre. But he doesn't want to go back there because he's got too much fucking pride. But remember, your dad at the back in leisure centres after he fucking been in stadium fights. He's a fucking prick. Thanks, Andy. Right, yeah, we're going to move on to... <laughs> We're going to move on to Canelo versus Rocky, which has nothing to do with Eddie either, by the way, but for everyone who's congratulating him. Uh, Gilberto Ramirez is fighting on Friday night against Jesse Hart. Bit of a mare fight, to be honest. The first one was was good. It was a, a good fight. I don't think we need to see the second fight. It says more about Ramirez's progress or lack thereof that he's going back in with Jesse Hart. Bob Arum is just filling the dates on ESPN. Not a great deal of interest in this one. Yeah, let's go on to the big one then, shall we? Let's get you in first, Ozzy, on this one. On the undercard, David Lemieux against Toriano Johnson, which might be a decent fight, actually. Both men know how to come forward and have a go at each other. Golden Boy are putting on the undercard. Katie Taylor against Eva Wallstrom. Saddam Ali against Mauricio Herrera. Lamont Roach against Alberto Mercado. It, it's not bad, actually, to be honest. I'm looking forward to a few fights on the undercard. Tevin Farm is going against Francisco Fonseca. Wasn't Fonseca, let me just check this live, wasn't he knocked out by Javonta Davis? Uh, I'm going to keep talking while I check this out and see if it, if it is indeed true. Yes, he was. He was, yeah. he was knocked out by Javonta Davis back a couple of years ago. So there you go. Yeah, the undercard's not too bad at all. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, to be honest. Ozzy, tell me about the main event, though. Canelo versus Rocky. Real-life Rocky story. Is Rocky even a, wo- a real world champion? Who knows? We'll park that to one side. Oz, I, I, Oz, I want you to start with Eva Wil- uh, Wilstrom and say that you would absolutely pump her doggy style. Who's this? Is this uh, French last is fighting Katie Taylor? She is smoking. Right, let me have a look. <laughs> On that, poor Obanov got a suffered a shock defeat there last week with a crippling body shot from oh, someone God. who looked like she could have been Phil Mitchell's girlfriend. Well, that's all right. As long as they're going to the body and not hitting her in the face. Um. I agree with you. I agree with you, Steve. It's a, it's a decent enough card, mate. In all honesty, it's, yeah, yeah. it's you know, Lemieux Johnson. You know, do you remember Johnson was getting muted as a, a fighter for a. Golovkin at one point. Mm. Farmer Fonseca. Um, I'm trying to remember who I've seen Fonseca against. That's uh, yeah, Davis. Javante Davis. Davis. That's yeah. the one. That's the one. Aye, Davis. So I don't know if Ozzy's found his uh, his cue yet. Actually. So yes. Ozzie, would, would you? Uh, uh, I'm on Google Images now. You would do. Eh? Oh, I definitely. Yeah, that's my yeah, man. Been threatened. Where's she from? Finish. Yeah. Fucking hell, she's 38 as well. Jesus Christ. Uh, hey, anyway, listen, mate, uh, listen, mate. Better the tune, uh, sorry, older the tune, better the fiddle. Or better the fiddle, older the tune, as the old saying goes. Go on, uh, anyway, back to what we're actually supposed to talk about. Uh, good card, I agree. It's pretty decent, actually. Um, Lemieux, Toriano, Johnson, that, that could be fun. Uh, Saddam Ali, Mauricio Herrera, pretty evenly matched that as well. Uh, looks like Ali's... Um, Gone back down to welterweight after his stint up at, at light middle. Uh, to be fair, the female for the Katie Taylor fight again, I, I could not give a toss. It just doesn't interest me whatsoever. Uh, again, Farmer Fonseca, it, it's it's a fight. Farmer should be winning. Uh, keep busy, really. I mean, God, when was that Tennyson fight? Was that October? It was October the twenty second. Yeah, so it's good to see him back out straight away and. I guess that if if he's going to keep busy, then you can accept these opponents as long as that the big fights do, do materialise. What I don't want to see is him in against Fonseca, then he boxes Carroll, then Frenoir, then Martin Ward pops up because he wins an eliminator and he boxes them because, I mean, Farmer, don't get me wrong, his bank balance will be rising handsomely, boxing essentially European-level opponents at best. Uh, going on to the main event, a fight, I think that 
surprised everybody when it was announced. I don't think anybody saw it coming. Uh, it's not for a world title. It's for a fringe title. It's it's not for a real uh, belt at all. But Rocky Fielding stepping up to the mark. I mean, I, I know he's the, naturally the bigger guy, but it is a huge, huge ask and one that I just don't give him an opportunity. I just don't give him a real chance in. Uh, don't dispute the guy from giving it a go. Like I said, it's the biggest fight of his career. Uh, he's probably fulfilling a dream boxing at Madison Square Garden against one of the biggest names in world boxing. I just think it's one step, one step too far for him. He'll, he'll definitely present some new problems to Canelo. Like I said, field, fielding's huge for a super middleweight. Uh, both in height and size as well. I think it's impressive the way you can still get down to 168. But when it comes to levels, you, Canelo's on another level. And I just think he'll have too much to for Rocky Fielding. I think he's going to target that body. Uh, we've seen Fielding destroyed to the body before against Callum Smith. Um, and I just think it'll be too much for him. But like I said, I, I mean, I, I'm not having a go at the fight or anything like that. It's... It's one of those that comes out the blue. I just thought Fielding gives it a go. I, I, I hope he doesn't freeze on the big stage. Uh, you know, like Jason Wellborn did last week. Yes, he may well be outclassed, but if he goes out there, gives it a go and puts it on Canelo, then then who knows? It, it might be interesting for a few rounds, but I, I see Alvarez uh, picking up this version of the, the world title. And I don't really know where he'll go after that, to be honest. Will he stay up at super middle? Or will he, is he just doing it just to, just to tick a box? I, I don't really know. Yeah, I'm going to bring Rob in on that point, actually. You, you lead me in perfectly, Ozzy, because this is what we're going to say. Putting the fielding fight aside, no disrespect to fielding, Rob, but we all agree that Canelo is going to win this fight. Is there a danger about quality control when it comes to Canelo? He's got this guaranteed deal, no need to sell pay-per-views anymore. He's getting 30-odd million dollars per fight for, what is it, 10 or 11 fights. Is there a chance that we might see a few more Rocky Fielding type opponents thrown Canelo's way? I'm worried about the standard of opposition, Rob. Yeah, I think this this one took us all by surprise. Like nobody was thinking after the Triple G win that he was going to go up to 68th so soon. And as well as that fight, Rocky Fielding, I think moving up to 68 is a bit of a statement as to where he is. Um, I think he's. I've been saying for a while. I think he's a 168 pounder, and I think that's why we had those. Uh, antics with the with the Mexican tackles. Like I don't think he can make sixty that comfortably like and this is probably a perfect op opponent for him if he wants to try campaigning at sixty eighth. Um I think Ozzy's dead right. Like I think he's gonna stop him to the body and I think it's gonna be early. Um I think Canelo is a is a great fighter um despite his tiny strike order. Well he's been exonerated so we have to accept the official line. I think he's a great fighter, just a level above Rocky feeling more than one level above Rocky feeling, and he should be able to put a bit of a beating on him with left hooks to the body. Um, and I think he'll stop him probably in the first five rounds of the fight. Like, there you go, Andy. First five rounds of the fight. Whenever Rocky stepped up against Callum Smith, it is you know, he, he did seem to freeze a little bit, didn't he? Smith yeah. was big and strong, a lot of power. Rocky will have the size advantages, but it's a huge ass for him. I don't begrudge him the opportunity, but he is huge. You just don't know. It might cause some problems with his, with his with his length, his reach, and stuff. You, you never know. But you would think that Canelo is just uh, that level above him. The bright lights, uh, so the bright lights again. You know, he's he's frozen the last two uh, big fights, so to speak. As Rob alluded to, you've alluded to it as well. So I would think that maybe Canelo, the fact is he doesn't need to. You know, he's, he probably is should have been at one sixty before he fought Golovkin. You know, he always had that kind of catch weight at 155 against like a Lara and Cotto for example but you, you would think he's not cutting much weight to make this fight 168 I would say Canelo doesn't get much up above like maybe 180 190 an absolute push so you would think he's he's not depleting himself and he should be looking slightly kind of thicker than that as well but I, I would say he's, he's going to stop him probably 7th 8th round where obviously the trademark left took probably a body shot Um. It'll be interesting. No, it'll be interesting to see how Rocky approaches it and stuff. He might want to try and kind of test Canelo early. Maybe want to kind of impose his physical size on him. Who knows? Um, I would hate to see him kind of like then come out and get and get ice in one round because it would just kind of like more or less kind of you know, confirm that he's a certain level of a fighter who just kind of freezes on the big stages and stuff. And you know that's just what it's going to be. So you'd want to see him kind of you know hold his own. 
So I think it was maybe uh, Aussie might have mentioned it, that maybe you know, put up what Jason Wellborn done, come out, have a, have a go, and uh, take it for there. You know, he might get lucky. You know, he's got a fair bit of dig about him, and you just never know if he, he catches Canelo light. Like, you know, something could could turn into that. But everything points to Canelo making a, a, a safe move up and wait here. End of the day as well. I think it's getting classified as a world title fight. Um, we all know deep down. This isn't a world title, you know. The main WBA champ is Callum Smith, and you know, for much as some people might hate to hear that, that is simple fact. It's just this is like the the, the second tier WBA world title. So again, it's, it's a safe fight for Kenel, in my opinion. I would think he's he's going to do it kind of like mid eight round mark at least. Yeah, I think it's going to be about five rounds. To be honest, maybe even four or five rounds. Uh, we're trying to get Donny on at the moment. Not succeeding. Hopefully, we'll get him on soon. We're going to move on to belly of the week. Somebody had asked me a question live on Twitter. I'm trying to find that now. Someone had sent him a question for Carl Greaves. Whoa, whoa. Yo, Donny. What's up? Ah, good to hear from you, man. Good to hear from you. Yeah, we've talked Kel Buck. We've talked Vasil Lomachenko. You can pretty much talk about whatever the hell you want. Uh, well, about the Canelo fight, I, I think that it's uh, a mistake to think that he's actually moving up in weight. I mean, his bigger money fights are Golovkin 3. You know, Jacobs, um, uh, maybe at some point the Charlos or whatever. I just think that he, he sees a low-hanging fruit here uh, and that, um, you know, he realizes that feeling is somebody he could beat uh, and he'd like to get this win. So he probably doesn't even have to put on too much weight um, in order to actually get the win because of the extreme gulf in terms of talent and, uh, and ability and skills. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think he's going to get that, get that little feather in his cap, a little jewel in his crown, and then probably come back down for the other, the other fights that seem to make sense, except he doesn't have to justify it as a, as a tick over fight or as a, uh, you know, as, as a kind of a soft matchup or whatever, because the argument is as well, how could it be a soft matchup? I'm moving up in weight. Um, you know, so I think, I think that's the thinking, at least I would, I would assume, um, unless he really is have I, I don't think he really struggles to make 160 as much um he was definitely struggling to make 154 but i think 160 is where he's meant to be and i also think it's where the money fights are so i don't really think he's uh on some sort of adventure up at 168 because there's not a whole lot of names up there because word on brook and loma then donnie before we go on to bell you the weeks uh brook um didn't look great last night i actually didn't see the whole thing but i did see highlights uh and I there mean, were highlights. What, what, what was that then? Like, I, well, I saw like a YouTube clip with, you know, <laughs> like some. I mean, but I mean, basically, the point is, is that, uh, I mean, I, it was a meaningless fight, right? I mean, we we talked about this last week. The fight had absolutely um, no discernible purpose whatsoever, except to just bide time and wait and hope Amir Khan picks up the phone and gives him a phone call. I mean, that's that's what the entire guy's uh, raison de etre. Uh, would be right. I mean, it's, that's that's what uh, that's the only thing that he's continuing to fight for, in my opinion. He wants that big cash out fight with Khan, so he can then, you know, uh, subsequently end uh, his career and retire on a a nice bed of money. Um, so, you know, I think that's uh, that's basically what he's what he's all about at this point. Um, and uh, let's see. So there's that. Plus, uh, next week we got uh, is it. Is Toriano Johnson versus David Lemieux on the undercard of uh, the Canelo fight? It is, yeah. That is actually, I think if that's going to be a sleeper, yeah. excellent fight. I've it's going to be a good fight. Guys, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because both of them have, well, actually, it, Lemieux doesn't have an iron chin, but he's an okay chin. And Toriano Johnson has an iron chin. And I've seen that guy take bombs, you know, before, and he just does not get knocked out. He's a tough bastard, and he also can really, really punch. Um, so. You know, you have two guys who have incredible power uh, in the same ring. And I don't know how long uh, the candle will burn. It might be a candle that burns at both, end, both ends, but it's going to be quite bright uh, while it burns. Uh, and I you know, I think that everybody should definitely want to tune in for that. Uh, I'm excited, of course, that to kick off the DAZN, um, uh, the DAZN, uh, you know, Canelo era, they're giving that fight to everyone for free. Um so that they will all, you know, presumably get hooked on uh, DAZN after they see a highlight real knockout from Canelo. So, 
um, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's a good thing. And then, I mean, honestly, if, if this means the end of Canelo being on pay-per-view and now all you have to do is subscribe to the zone, the months that he's fighting, that's pretty good. Uh, it's a pretty good outcome for the consumer. And I'm pretty happy with that. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, just in general, uh, uh, also Lomachenko, I guess my thoughts there are, uh, I did, I did see that one. Uh, and I mean, you know, he didn't look amazing, but, uh, I, I, and as I heard earlier in the podcast, cause I was able to listen uh, before just now, um, you know, he's up at a higher weight that is in his natural weight class. He's coming off of surgery. He unifies a title and we're not impressed. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's a pretty, uh, like he set his own standards so high that it's just, uh, you know, it's impossible for him to fulfill. The only thing, the only way he could go higher is by beating Mikey Garcia, but now, Garcia is on this adventure up at uh, 147 taking on Spence. So that kind of, I mean, the fight probably wasn't going to happen anyway, but now that really sort of deprives him of that opportunity. And it's hard to see how, what Lomachenko could do to impress us some more because he's already done so much uh, with so few fights in his pro career. And so um, his biggest opponent really right now is himself. Excellent assessment, Donny. I just installed you as the new official voice of American boxing, so congratulations on that. <laughs> what happened? Was, was Dave on vacation? Yeah, I've had enough of him. He didn't turn up, so we fucked him off. <laughs> Fuck him off. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> right, if anybody has any Bell of the Weeks, prepare them now. We're going to end up on a sad note as well. Uh, one of the boxer, former book world champion, passed away. Marcus Bio. We'll be talking about him right at the end of the show. But first of all, the funny stuff, the belly of the weeks, we'll get on with that, shall we? I'll be flying through them. I've got about 50-odd, to be honest. So if I do yours a disservice and you're listening in, I do apologise, because sometimes it's hard to get the context of them, like, four or five days later. Anyway, that's the disclaimer in there. Sean Stevenson has nominated David White, Scotty. This could be one of your boyos, Rob, at Finglass D 11 He said, not that many would fight Spike O'Sullivan, regardless of the money. He's a top boxer. There you go. What do you think about that one, Rob? Rob has no opinion on that one. Anyway, we'll move on then. Um, who else have we got? Uh, we have Boxing Bet Guru has nominated uh, Gay Brado, who is talking about Ali. Come on, man. Ali was a showman with a mouth. And then he was going on about in relation to Tyson Fury. Uh, T Foster, Tom Craze nominated Maria McIntyre. She was a bit, she didn't, well, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to shit on Maria McIntyre too much, to be honest with you, because she didn't understand betting, and I don't really understand betting either. But she was asking William Hill, can you tell me how you figured Fury lost every single round? Nine of these bets should have won, she thought. And William Hill got back in touch with her. This is for Tyson Fury to win the fight in that round. It says round betting, says Maria McIntyre. How is a bet on a round the result of the bet? It's to win the round. And William Hill went back to her. It is to win the fight in that round. This is why the prices are so big. T Foster has nominated Maria for that one, uh, for that little indiscretion. And uh, you've nominated FC Barcelona. And the list goes on. Fury can't live a second without calling out AJ. Wilder made him look good yesterday, and I didn't see anything special about the fight. That two garrulous persons, it proves nothing to their fans. Another casual, Andy, FC Barcelona. Yeah, I mean, they were out in force. Uh, I forget that that female bint that it was uh, actually in the, in, the, in the blocker and stuff like that who said that like the, the punches that Tyson was taking, especially for the knockout, the knockdown in the 12th was actually fake. Oh, we've got her, yes. We've got oh, her. my God. She needs to get her head in the cooker, by the way. <laughs> Hopefully that gas one as well. Uh, yeah, Bexing, Boxing Bet Guru rather has nominated the fight game 24-7. It's fight week, says the, twen says the fight game. Special K Brook returns to the ring. Uh, Anthony Fowler becomes Anne the New. Josh Kelly is back in action. John O'Carroll is fighting the Eliminator. Kid Galha Galahad is fighting in a featherweight contest. I can't wait. Hashtag uh, matchroom boxing. Well, the fight game, we're looking forward to that one. Anyway, uh, me and my computer ke screen keeps on freezing, so sorry about the occasional... Stuttering there, everybody. Uh, Boxing Boy has nominated Alex Tyree for talking about Amir Khan. Uh, Sean Stevenson has nominated Momo Diaz. Anthony Joshua beats both Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder. He has the power and the fundamental boxing skills. Anthony Joshua is a fundamentally better boxer than Tyson Fury, says this gentleman. Uh, Josh Fitzgerald, uh, one of the worst things I've just seen on Sky Sports, White versus Chisora advert and background music of Silent Night with cut scenes of a choir boy singing. Uh, Box Hard podcast has nominated Book of Nicodemus, talking about AJ. 
uh, of knocking out Parker, etc. Greg Cross has nominated Harry Charlton for saying uh, he was fighting a 15 stone lightweight. This was Tyson Fury, by the way. If he could punch, he would have knocked Wilder out. Remember Joshua Floyd Klitschko? Fury just grabbed him. If he can't beat a 15 stone weakling, he has no chance against uh, Joshua. Boxing Bet Guru has nominated Andrew Bryce, a fan advocating a fighter not to fight the best guys in his division. He's basically saying that Kel Brook should duck Jarrett Hurd. Uh, Todd Grisham has uh, been nominated by Matty. Yes, you can say you thought Tyson Fury won the fight, but to say a man who only landed 13 more punches and was dropped twice, once a near-death experience was robbed, is crazy. Chill out. Greg Cross nominated Jamel Charlo. Uh, Wilder won by KO in the 12th round, says Jamel. He's talking about the long count. Sire's nominated Ross Hamilton. Um, he's talking to David White. Ross, no, David Allen, sorry. Ross Hamilton says, you definitely owe it to your talent, mate. All the best. You have a lot of people rooting for you. Uh, Mikey Hugh has nominated Darren Ryan. Terry Woodfine has nominated Ellie Seckback, the little weasel, absolutely rimming Deontay Wilder after the Fury fight. He also calls him a rat. Uh, Joe Thackeray has nominated Sturkey. Talking to Carl Frampton, you'll be climbing a hill when you get in the ring with Josh Warrington on the 22nd of December, Carl. Kenners has nominated some guy on Talk Sport who's just said that big baby Miller is the best heavyweight in the world. Here we go, Andy. We're on to Melissa Louise Sheridan. The second punch Wilder threw at Fury to knock him down was nowhere near as hard as it should have been to nearly KO Fury. And then he gets up after play acting like he was nearly knocked out. 60 seconds later, he starts showboating. What does that tell you? Says Melissa staged and she put up a little video of someone carrying an oscar to me that chick is a bloke she is or he is absolutely thick as fucking mince and the shit and in their bottle um that's what i'm going to say but she's just fucking stupid or he i should say yeah uh, giles has nominated jake wood for thinking that the teddy atlas rant speech was about tyson fury this is a good one and you got a lot of traction actually that you put in from uh joe tebo no sorry josh tebo uh, conspiracy theorist Josh, oh, after, after watching it over 200 times now, I'm sure, I'm not sure how hard that punch actually landed on Fury in the last round. Hint of him being off balance and Fury dramatising it. Then again, did look into his eyes when the back of his head from the above camera. Josh Tebow uh, smelling a conspiracy, Andy? I think he's the, the front runner just now, actually. Aching for my attention uh, at this present, present moment in time as well, actually. Definitely. I think he listens as well, so he'll be... Oh, well, he, does. Yeah. he listens to everything we say, mate. This is how he gets his opinions. Okay, there you go then. Josh Tebow, you're the front runner. Uh, Pucking Frick has nominated many. He's nominated Eddie, though. Wilder Fury wasn't a great fight, says Eddie. Uh, Fury has turned himself into a nice little folk hero. Good on him, says Eddie. The condescending, the condescending knob, says Pucking Frick. Well said. Matthew Skelton has nominated the guy on TalkSport as well. Truly award-winning stuff He's talking about baby miller a few other people have nominated that as well vince cummings has been nominated by pucking freak vince from the boxing rant turns out though that vince was actually quoting deontay wilder so pucking freak has also been nominated so it's like a double nomination here these boys are rolling around on the floor trying to hit each other trying to nominate one another that's how big the value of the week has become melissa louise sheridan not happy with one nomination has nominated herself twice she just went completely with this fake boxing is fake narrative. She said it wasn't even a hard punch and Fury went down like a sack of spuds. The way Wilder was acting after the knockdown looked suspicious as well. Play acting almost. Boxing is an entertainment business, says Melissa Louise Sheridan. I did uh, extend her an invitation to come on the pod. She declined. Uh, Danny Robslowski has nominated Glasses Malone. I know he's been nominated before. You are amongst the greatest era of heavyweights, says Glasses. This is even better than Ali, Frazier, <laughs> Norton and Foreman. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Chill, Andy, only on number 28. Who's the front runner at the moment, would you say? Josh Tebow. But Josh that Tebow. one, that one's... That, read that one out again. That needs a special re-mention. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna go back over on this one, actually. Let's just go back for Josh Tebow. He said, a conspiracy theory, Josh, after watching it 200 times now, I'm not sure how hard that punch actually landed on Fury in the last round. Hint of him being off balance and Fury dramatising it. Then again, did look like his eyes were in the back of his head from the above camera. Oh, As yeah. Jim Carrey said, lie, lie in the courtroom. Come on! <laughs> Jack Morgan has nominated Melissa. Uh, Louise Sheridan as well. Martin Hurry has nominated 
Dr. Joseph, THD, PhD. Honestly, if a champion knocks his challenger down twice, says Joseph, it means the champion's supposed to win the bout. Deontay Wilder won the bout. The bad officiating judge called it a split decision, though I have predicted it, but they robbed Deontay Wilder, period, says the doctor. Eddie Hearn is talking about Special K weighing in 150 pounds, and Mark Oliver jumped in. He said, Eddie, hi, Eddie. If the Amir Khan fight does not happen, please can you arrange a special The Gloves Are Off, bringing them together and explaining why. That would be great TV. <laughs> so a gloves are off for not a fight not happening is what Mark Oliver's calling Brooke, for. So, Brooke so will probably take that. The, the, gloves, the gloves are off and then not going to come back on <laughs> at all. <laughs> Go on, Rob. I was going to say Brooke would take that, I'd say. <laughs> he probably would take the payday. David Tarbuck's nominated it anyway. Matthew Skelton has nominated PSTM09 for this embarrassing tweet. Fantasy fight, who wins? Retweet for Anthony Joshua, like for Mike Tyson. Uh, ben Thorns has nominated Derek, uh, Derek Chisora. <laughs> Derek an analogy, apparently in this gloves are off thing. I, I, I don't watch this it. This was brilliant. This yeah. was fucking brilliant. And apparently Derek Chisora said, Rob, have you ever taken one of those laxative pills? You take it, you pop and you wait for 20 minutes. Then you go to the toilet and they go through you. That's what I'm going to do to Dillian White. <laughs> A rather odd analogy, says TD. No wonder he, it was met with this expression. <laughs> you saw Dillian White <laughs> just looking completely clueless, like... What? Did well, that was, Dillian White actually like said that to him. He's Dillian White actually said to him. He said, "What, Derek? That's a bit of a that's a bit of a weird analogy." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should have. I'm going to try and get the audio for that if I can, because I think they put it on uh, YouTube. We'll try and get the audio for that one for you. Uh, Josh uh, Fitzgerald has nominated Scott Hames. Uh, Joshua versus Klitschko was a much better fight, in my opinion, the best heavyweight title fight in history. <laughs> What? Hang on a minute. Sorry, let's reread this. Scott Haim said that Joshua versus Klitschko was the best heavyweight fight in history. That may be a bit deep, but I'm putting that, it out That there. again proves to me that uh, said fucking prickhead has not watched heavyweight boxing since Joshua came on the scene. Because you could go fucking back uh, decades. Decades. 90s, the 80s, the 70s, the 50s. Oh, Mr. Christ. These casuals shouldn't be allowed on social media, by the way. They can't be allowed to spout this shit. Do you think that he should have had his Twitter banned for that? Yeah, exactly. He should be fucking. He should be banned for Twitter permanently. ID banned, email banned, all that fucking stuff. He shouldn't be able to fucking reprocreate. That's how fucking bad he is, by the way. He shouldn't be able to educate any fucking future children. <laughs> Sterilisation and he calls yeah, out. Exactly, exactly. I agree with that. You should um, be sterilised until you can actually prove that you can actually afford to bring up a child. You're actually socially compass maintenance. You're actually got a wee bit of education about you. You just, you know, you're just not a real scumbag who wants to live off fucking welfare and all that sort of stuff. Just fuck off. <laughs> He's on one tonight. <laughs> He's on rare form, isn't he? He's on rare form. Uh, Puck and Frick is nominated Chris Mannix. Just watched back Wilder Fury with Wilder watching for the first time. Wilder admitted it was a tough t fight to score, but he only gave Fury... Uh, two rounds. Let's move on. Mitch Morata, uh, Mitch, Mitch, Mitch Morata, Rich Morata. Sorry, rather, uh, was talking about something. Sugar Ray Leonard jumped in and said, "What's your take on Canelo's next opponent, Roger Field?" <laughs> so Canelo's not fighting Rocky Fielding in the world of Sugar Ray Leonard. He's fighting Roger Field. So I don't know what planet uh, Sugar Ray's on at the moment, but quite a few people uh, picked up on that one. Kevin Watson was nominated. Steve Evans. Uh, Greg Cross nominated this one. Amanda was jumping in, saying that uh, Kel Brook should shouldn't be fighting with only one eye. But uh, Kel was actually winking on the on the scale, so I think Amanda got the wrong end of the stick. Was was concerned about him anyway. Uh, Dominic Henry, friend of the pod, has nominated little little Lord Fauntleroy. Eddie Hearn asked by Alistair Campbell who the zones big star names are in the US. Eddie replies, "Well, we've got Joel Miller." Uh, Chad Hogan has nominated Schaefer. I support women's boxing, Boxing says uh, Schaefer. Steve Kim should be held, to, held accountable for his sexist views. Clarissa Shields is not only a great boxer, but quite the looker too. I think that might be a bit Steve of a... Steve Kim is a racist cunt muscle, by the way. That's what he hears, fucking slanty-eyed cunt. I think... I th <laughs> That's what he calls himself, that's what he calls himself, slanty-eyed, so he can't fucking turn and say that and be racist. Right? That's what he calls <laughs> himself, that fucking arsehole. All right, so then he started his pish. <laughs> Well, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> uh, Brian King has nominated Taylor H. Smith. When you get your when your brother gets a picture with Dave Allen and sends it to you, hashtag life is complete, hashtag jealous. What do you think about this one, Ozzy? He's got absolutely fuck all going for him if his life is complete because he has a picture with David Allen. 
Well, you know what? I've got another nomination from Sean Stevenson. Melvin also got a photo. Dave Allen, as everyone says, is one of the nicest people in the boxing game. He may well be a nice person, but the fact that people's lives are complete because they've got a fucking picture with him. Jesus Christ. And Dave, Dave, focused, aren't they? Dave would have hated that as well, you know, taking the photos. He really doesn't like that whole yeah, aspect of boxing. Well, can I just say that, Dave, man of the people, Alan, you know, he wears carry mores, etc., things like that. He was wearing a uh, a brand new Stone Island jacket last night, which is probably clocked to 400 quid. But he's a man of the people. Just remember that. Happy shopper carrier bag, Ozzy, you know? No, definitely not that. Oh, it's, it's, it's got two houses, so where are you got, Ozzy? <laughs> exactly, yeah. This is what I mean now. People are saying he's fighter of the year because he's got two houses. <laughs> Eddie Seriously? Paid off mortgages. Seriously? There you go. That's what people are saying about him now. It's all about the houses, not about the fights. <laughs> Arvin Panazar has nominated Carl Froch for blaming Khan for Brooks' poor performance and also mentioning Khan uh, 15,627,367,063 times. There you go, Arvin. I counted that out for you. Uh, Darren Cope has nominated Jack. What a dreadful performance from Brook. But if any of you believe Khan wants it, you're totally deluded. He is absolutely petrified of the fight. Okay. Uh, Sam Strong point, Andy. Uh, boxing is clearly not his strong point. He says, honestly, think that only reason Khan didn't fight Mayweather and Pacquiao in his prime is because they dodged it. He went up two weights, got done by Canelo. Why does everyone think that the Khan Brook fight is owed to the British public? A lot has been slated in AK for years. So why demand it? Sam Strong point. That's a strong entry, actually. That was a very strong entry. Again, actually, he said that, uh, was it, he, that Cam was ducking the Brook fight because he was chasing Mayweather, or Mayweather yeah. and that were, were ducking him because. Ducking him, yeah, yeah. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> At the end of the day, is I think that fight was getting mooted, and then Mayweather took it and fought Pacquiao. I think I'm right in saying that. Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah. So there we go. There we go. We all needed and wanted that fight. At the end of the day, just to get a wee bit of closure. Well, Mayweather and Pacquiao clearly fought each other to duck Khan. I mean, it's the only way they could get out of the fight. Well, the hand speed. Logical. Yeah. Hand yeah. speed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Greg Cross has nominated Anthony Fowler. Fowler was having a go at Ted Cheeseman. Ted, chill out. You're getting that head of yours boxed off. You're a domestic level brawler, and that's all you will be. Wait and see. Greg Cross has nominated Fowler rightfully for thinking that he is past domestic level. Uh, Prime Mike Tyson, Pucking Frick again, has nominated Eddie Hearn. Eddie Hearn reacts to Brookwin over Zarafa, Khan Crawford. Um, yeah, and various other things. Uh, Dominic threw a question in as well about Tyson Fury. That's all I've got there. Uh, 46 strong. I had 51 altogether. I had to can a few. I've got 46 there. Anybody else got any to throw in or should we just close it now? Because I think we've got a clear winner. Close it. All right, okay. I'll leave it for next week then. No, go on, Rob. Throw it in. Chuck it in. Come on. Chuck it in, Rob. I had a good O'Hara Davis one. Somehow these videos come up in my timeline because I'm watching all boxing videos and it was an O'Hara Davis vlog and the title was Stop financing these holes. I've and, watched, uh, I've watched it. Yeah, O'Hara goes on to tell a story about how he spent 10, 10 stacks on a bird bringing her to America. Five grand now included the flights and accommodation, but he spent the rest on food. So he said that that's unacceptable for a girl you only know three months. And he went on to tell a story that might ring familiar with some of our community because a girl set up an account on Bumble and she had big boobs, he said, and she was looking for attention from men and she kept these men on, on, on the text line for six weeks and then she hit them all with a sob story that she needed two grand and she made 80 grand and disappeared. <laughs> so Hara was dealing with the real issues that young men are going through. Stop uh, financing these holes was the title of the video and O'Hara giving out some real gems there. like so. Ah, good. Worth cutting some audio from that maybe, Rob? Uh, yeah, oh, 1 million percent. And obviously, the I don't know, my sound was cutting in and out, but obviously Deontay for posting that Twitter video with the counter on it. Like, let it go, dude. You got the head boxed off you. That's it. And you couldn't knock him out. That's it. It wasn't a long count. It's yeah. a discretionary 10 count you moron. Like, how? who are the people around you that are letting you away with that? Like, it's a discretionary 10 count. It's not 10 seconds automatic clock in Jack Reese's head, you muppet. The thing Hang on, is, well, a fighter, a fighter, a referee's got to check the fighter is A, ready to box on, He's got to do his safety checks. And he's got to then go wipe his gloves off and then ask him, are you ready to box? I can take between 15 and 20 seconds. So, you know, it's just reaching, baby. It's all it is. I've just had a, a live one nominated to me on Twitter. This could be a good one, Rob. Devon Alexander, Matthew Skelton has sent this in. Devon is talking about running for Congress, American Congress, in 2020. What do you think? <laughs> Devon Alexander, he's it's got a little mocked up picture as well. Could you imagine? He's obviously, he's he's obviously going to be... He's, he's obviously going to be... A, a hardline Republican, isn't he? <laughs> so, 
<laughs> yeah, we 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 already know his feelings on the uh, uh, all, all matters rectal. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> bit like your, bit like yourself, Donny, with the seven years. You know what I mean? Yeah, Donny. Do you think Alexander could win, or do you think it'd be a bit of a stretch? Seven year in or baby. <laughs> You're thinking about it too deep now, Donny. Come on, look at it. It always man. deteriorates, doesn't it? Starts <laughs> off good every week. We end up here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just seeing if anybody else has thrown any in. Uh, while I'm searching, <laughs> anybody anybody got any other nominations? Can I can I make my vote? Do you want to go on? Throw one in through the back door, Andy. I've not got one. If, um, I just want to um, vote for like Josh Tebow, the, that Ray Murder Lewis fucking supporting bastard, Baltimore Ravens asshole. Um, I want to vote for him just purely again for the conspiracy theorist. Matty D G would be actually proud of that fucking that saying. By the way, that's really good. Okay, I think everybody, um, Rob, Josh Tebo for you, yeah? No, yes. I'd, I'd, I'd say i go with Deontay just for, for posting that video. Absolutely. And then he posted another cryptic message today. He said, the truth will see, you will see the truth. And some kind of fist up. Like, I don't know what he's trying to imply. Like, did the, Was there some kind of conspiracy? A robot was controlling Tyson Fury's head and picked him up off the ground <laughs> at five. What's he trying to get at? Like, I don't know. But yeah, so Deontay for his antics this week on his press tour. Uh, who are you going for, Ozzy? I'm going for that woman who kicked off with William Hill when she put a pound on each of the rounds, thinking tight she won money if Tyson Fury actually won the round <laughs> rather than the fight. I'm sorry, you shouldn't be gambling, love. If you're uh, you're putting money on that and you're thinking you're winning every time, daft cow. So yeah, she gets my vote. Maria McIntyre. Uh, who are you going for, Donny? Oh, the guy that said that. Uh... The 1970s heavyweight division with uh, Foreman, Frazier, all, all those, all those guys was uh, was not as good as it is right now. Oh yeah, uh, I can't remember his name. It was that long yeah. ago, but I know which one you mean. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was, I was, well, I was between that and also the lady who was tweeting William Hill, thinking that she won money. I was uh, Maria McIntyre. But, uh, but I mean, yeah, but that's just, uh, you know, that that would just that would be punching down, wouldn't it? Uh, I mean, yeah, she, she clearly didn't know. Uh, <laughs> you all right there, Donnie? You're going to be Stephen Hawking on us? <laughs> so you, you know, you can't, you can't make fun of the... the <laughs> you fucker, right. I thought that was me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry. Donnie, do you want to try again just quickly there? You, we lost you. <laughs> no, fuck you guys. I'm hanging out. <laughs> Raging. <laughs> I'm oh, done. Good stuff. I'm done. Good stuff. Fuck off. Good stuff. Did fucking... you find a house last week, by the way, Donnie? Huh? Did you find a house? You know where you're looking for a house last week? Did you find it? Oh, one? no. We're, we're, we are looking for houses. Uh, and uh, probably February, March would be when we'll be moving. But uh, we got we got a few in mind. Just Have you, you... You know when it comes, you know when it comes to moving house, Donny. Which boxers would you enlist to help you move house? I was thinking you could maybe have He's Maurice, Maurice Hocker drive. You could have Maurice Hocker drive in the removals van, and <laughs> you, could, you could have Oscar, Oscar De La Hoya organising your wife's clothes in the wardrobe for you. He's, you know? he's dad for that envelope and the Canelo. <laughs> <laughs> he, he does have very <laughs> can mean, uh, very fine taste in the room. You could have Chris Eubank Jr., Donnie. He could right, be the guy right, who says he's going to help you and then he, he doesn't turn up. So there you go. You, I, I, I don't think about that for you. <laughs> right, anyway, uh, congratulations, Josh Tebo. Oh, right there. Get rid of him. Sorry, Donnie, no um, no sympathy here. I'm trying to get rid of him. Is he still there? No, let's go on. Right, Josh Tebo, congratulations to you. Let's finish up this week on a sad note. Andy, I know you'll have some interest in this one. Marcus Bay, I didn't even know he was sick, to be honest with you. 47 years of age, died of cancer this week. Former WBC uh, super middleweight champion, wasn't he? He had a great fight with Richie Woodall back in 1999. They show this one on Box Nation from time to time. There was uh, he, he won the title that night. He got knocked out by Glenn Catley in 2000 in Frankfurt. and He had an up-and-down career, but I mean, most of it was up, to be honest with you, before he lost to... Uh, Mikel Kessler towards the end, that was his one from last fight. Had fights with Saki Obika. He took a rematch with Danny Green, which I give him a lot of credit for. The first one, he got knocked down by Green, I think it was, a couple of times and ended up getting through because of disqualification. Saki Obika opened him up with headbutts and stuff. And he was a nice, smooth boxer, but I suppose like Rocky Gianni, 
the real story is here. I mean, he just, you know, died too young, and it's sad to see someone going like that. Yeah, and I often wonder as well, as, I mean, you know, if you read Johnny Nelson's book, I mean, I'm not making any insinuations, maybe I am, but Johnny Nelson, who had uh, bought a uh, sparred uh, behind the Iron Curtain, uh, Old East Germany, uh, Marcus Baer was born behind the, the Iron Curtain as well, so you wonder as well, as you know, because some people do believe like Lance Armstrong's cancer was brought on by PED use, was it maybe the, the case with, with Marcus Baer? I don't know, but, you know, it's, it's a hell of a young age to be dying young with, with, with cancer, and that maybe just be thinking badly these Germans, I really don't know, but um, good amateur, picked up titles as an amateur, uh, I think he was a bronze world, world medalist, maybe he picked up silver in the, the, the Europeans, I think there have been some sort of shenanigans going on as well, apparently one of the European, uh, or maybe even the world actually, um, some allegations of some corruption going on and stuff, but if he, he fought some good fighters, Eric Lucas, Danny Green, Omar Sheka, Joe Kozagi beat him as well, Saki Obiga was obviously always going to be awkward, difficult fighter to look good against, and, you know, Michael Kessler, um, which was a, a, that was a bad knockout, by the way, he got dominated in that fight, was, I remember, I think I might be right to say that uh, Kessler might knock him out by a three-punch combo, but yeah, anyway, an uppercut or whatever. That was what set up the Kozagi fight, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think it was, actually, it was for, for all the marbles and that, so it was a pretty emphatic knockout, but, yeah, to to go that young is it's it's bad. It's bad. It says again. I'm 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 just kind of basically pointing out the fact is that he's he's that age. He was born in seventy one. That area, the the world at that point, you know, everything was dominated towards sports. Um, you know, the world when they come down to like the nineteen ninety, maybe, you know, maybe maybe PEDs were in use here. But at the end of the day, as we always, he's left he left behind a wife and they. Couple of kids, and it's, it's sad to see actually. But he was he was a decent fighter. Um, that's all I can really say about him. In all honesty, no, he was a good skilled fighter, Andy. I think you summed it up quite well there. Um, yeah, let's let's finish it up then there, guys. It's we're getting quite late. Thank you for everyone who's jumped on and joined us and stuck with us. I suppose we're not live still at the moment, even though people do occasionally ask. But you'll get this upload late on the Sunday night. If you listen to this, hit the thumbs up and all that stuff. Tell. Tell the YouTube and iTunes and all them people that you enjoy listening to us still. Cheated, not defeated. Rob Kelly's there. He's fighting on regardless. Battling with 4G. Donny was on as well. Thanks to him. Thanks to Ozzy, as always, and to Andy for joining us. We also had Steve Wood on the call. Adam Smido Smith. Carl Greaves was on as well, talking Josh Kelly and David Avanessian. We'll be back next week to talk Field and Canelo, also to preview the Frampton at Josh Warrington fight. Uh, White Chisora and Charlo and all those bits and pieces and trying to work out when we'll speak to you over Christmas. Thank you for sticking with us. We're, I've been Steve Wellings. We'll speak to you all again around the same sort of time, same place next week. Bye.